All right, good evening, everyone. This is the regular meeting of the Downers Grove Grade School District 58 Board of Education here on Monday, March 13, 2023, at 7 p.m. at the Downers Grove Village Hall. This meeting is being live streamed for the public on the Village of Downers Grove's YouTube channel. Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Doshi. Here. Member Ellis is absent. Member Hannes? Here. Member Harris? Here. Member Olchek? Here. Member Weiner? Here. Member Hughes? Here. Tonight, on the, uh, tonight, members of the audience will have an opportunity to provide public comment to the board later on in the agenda. The board asks anyone wishing to comment to please fill out a card and indicate the topic to be addressed. These can be placed in the basket on the table over there to my right. I have allotted 30 minutes tonight for public comment. All right, we're going to start off today with the Pledge of Allegiance, as we always do, so I want to welcome Highland School. Principal Kraft, welcome. Good evening. Thank you for having us tonight. I'm very excited to be able to share some of the work that has gone on throughout Highland, both um, our culture work and also around our school improvement plan. So with us here today, I have our student council president, Johnny Vlahos, our student council vice president, Katerina Pitsalos, our sixth grade secretary, Stella Zazinski, and our fifth grade secretary, Alex Nash. Our staff sponsors for student council are Mrs. Dunlap and Mrs. Veras. But our student council officers will kick us off by sharing some of the great work that they've been doing this year. Hi, my name is Johnny Vlahos, and I'm the sixth grade president of Highland School. We have some awesome service projects at Highland. In the past, we have done many service projects to help our community. We sponsored our annual giving tree in which we collected items such as clothing and toys for families in need. Those are donated to FISH, a local organization that helps those in need in Downers Grove, Westmont, Darien, Woodridge, and Lyle. They are also donated to the Humanitarian Service Project. It is a DuPage community service organization that reaches approximately 100 families living in poverty. We also wrote Thanksgiving card for a local retirement home called Peace Manor nearby. Our last and final serve project was a money donation to a wildlife sanctuary in Africa. The Longley Wildlife Sanctuary is an organization that helps free animals in need of rehabilitation. We collected over $100 asking kids which animal they thought was the cutest. Service projects help make our community a better place. The people in the community help us, so now it's our turn to help them. Good evening, everyone. Hope you've been having an excellent day. My name is Katerina Pitsilos, and I'm the fifth grade vice president of Highland Elementary School Student Council. One of our favorite things to do at our school is having spirit days. Spirit days are a fun way for students to show off or express their school spirit. Some spirit days that we've done in the past years are PJ Day, Disney Day, and so many more. For days like these, students may show spirit through clothes, accessories, and actions. Spirit days also give a chance for students to express what they have in common with one, none, one another. Spirit weeks are another favorite. We've had one recently for holiday spirit. Spirit days are planned by the student council officers and representatives. We've had some new, fun spirit days ideas for the 2022-2023 school year, such as Decked Out Desk Day, Game Day, Student Teacher Switch Day, and Be A New Me Day. These are just a few ways we plan to show our spirit at Highland School this year. Student Council also plans what we call money makers. Money makers are a fun way to make money for our school. One recent money maker we have done is the holiday pen and pencil sale. It was so fun because it gave people a chance to learn about money and sales. All of the money Student Council raises goes directly to Highland School. In the past, we have bought a sign for the school, water bottle filler water fountain, recess equipment, and outdoor table for students to enjoy during recess. Money makers and spirit days are a great way for Highland to be a great place. Thank you. Hello, my name is Stella and I'm the sixth grade secretary at Highland Elementary. The student council has had many, many 
amazing and brilliant ideas thanks to our students. Some things that has happened this year are mirrors in the bathroom, which started last year. At the last meeting of the year, it was brought up and we talked to Mr. Kraft and he made it happen. Now we can look our best all the time. The next idea we got is the joke jar. The joke jar is exactly what it sounds like, jokes in a jar. Each week, one joke is chosen from the jar and that joke is highlighted during the Monday morning announcements. Any student can write their name and their class and of course their joke. The last student voice example is the one of the most underrated. Everyone knows about the officers, but the real people behind all this are the representatives. The reps go back to their classes and gather ideas and then communicate the great ideas back to student council, ensuring every student can have a voice. This leads to all the kids getting involved. In conclusion, student voice make not just good ideas, but a better school. Thank you for listening. Hello everyone, I'm Alex Nash, the fifth grade secretary here at Highland. We are going to kick off the year with these upcoming activities. During the school year, we want to continue helping people in need. We are going to be donating to the West Suburban Community Food Pantry. A few facts about this pantry are, is that they have served 57,000 people in need. This was a great time to start donating because people stopped donating after the holidays. This is a great service project idea from our representatives because not everyone has the privilege to be able to give away money. So in this service project, we can donate non-perishable foods to everyone who chooses is to um, may participate. An upcoming Spirit Day is Cubs for Sox Day. One of the biggest debates throughout Highland is which team is better, the Chicago Cubs or the Chicago Sox? <laughs> <laughs> and up, um, in this long-awaited, anticipated Spirit Day, students may defend their team in is, by dressing in jerseys, hats, and other attire supporting either the Sox or the Cubs. Moving on to Highland's upcoming moneymaker, Highland will be hosting a school store. We will be selling items like styluses, mechanical pencils, erasable pens, pencil cases, lead, erasers, and other fun school supplies students can buy with just a few coins or dollar bills. Um, with all the money we've raised, we would like to get our school a nice gift. We are debating between a new bench in front of the school and another outdoor table by the blacktop. Thank you for having us speak tonight. Thank you. Next, we have our PTA co-presidents, uh, Julia Mashek and Carrie Blonde, to talk about some of the great work our Highland PTA does. Good evening, and thank you for having us. My name is Julia Mashek, and this is Carrie Blonde, and we are the co-presidents at Highland PTA. It's been a very exciting year uh, being able to bring back of all, all of our previous PTA events and activities. We added a new Parents' Night Out fundraiser this year, which was, which was a huge success. That, coupled with our readathon, has allowed us to provide many fun activities for our students and families, as well as support to the staff. We are at the end of our One Book, One School program, where families received a copy of the one and only Ivan to read together. We kicked off the program with an evening event at school where we hosted families with presentations by the Lincoln Park Zoo, the Donners Grove Library, and Mr. Kraft read the first chapter to the students. This year, we were able to bring back our in-school roller skating event. The third to sixth graders were, got to skate during PE um, using rented skates. At the end of the week, we held a family roller skating night at the Ro Lombard Roller Skating Rink. This event has always been well attended, and we are very sad that it will be our last year hosting it as they will be closing this spring. We still have quite a few activities to finish out the year. This weekend, we will be hosting a parent-child luau in our gym with a DJ and desserts. Then we will host a book swap, a VIP grandparent day, an end of year party, and a free pizza lunch during field day. In support of our staff at Highland, we have offered small stipends for classroom needs during American Education Week. The PTA also provides teachers meals during parent-teacher conferences, as well as a week of food and other gifts during Staff Appreciation Week. The PTA was proud to improve the school itself this year by funding the Frosted Glass on the nurse's office window, and we will be covering part of the cost of a new projector system for the Highland Gym. Carrie and I, as co-presidents, are blessed to have a talented PTA board and volunteers for all of our committees. The people do, who devote their time from their busy lives to improve the Highland community is inspiring. 
We are fortunate to have a great partnership with Mr. Kraft and all of the staff at Highland. Thank you. Thank you. A few points of pride from this year before we move on to our school improvement pro, uh, plan. So this year, uh, we began implementing a positive reinforcement ticket called the Husky High Five, which the students named last year. Students can earn a Husky High Five uh, for being respectful, responsible, or safe, and Stella's passing those out right now uh, to you. Uh, it's a nice perforated ticket with one end being able to go home so students can have a conversation about how they were respectful, responsible, or safe with their parent. Then the other one goes in their class bin, and we use uh, our high fives in a few different ways. So at our all school meeting, uh, we pull different high fives, uh, and any student that's chosen uh, gets a reward uh, that comes out of the Highland prize bin. Uh, there's a variety of things. One of the popular items are, uh, as Katarina will model, the Highland uh, sunglasses <laughs> are a very hot commodity right now, uh, but also our uh, water bottle stickers that Alex will come around and pass out to our highly sought after. In addition to individual prizes you'll see there, we have a high five tube. Once we fill that up, uh, each month we gather all of the high fives that we earn throughout the month and work to fill up our tube. Once it's full, uh, we earn an all school prize. So for example, we had a glow lunch, uh, maybe a movie at lunch, extra recess, things like that. But it's a, a nice way that students have bought into as positive reinforcement for being respectful, responsible, or safe. Last year we worked to develop common expectations for our students with our, uh, with our kids and our staff, uh, which are now posted throughout the building, again, rooted in our three core values of being respectful, responsible, and safe. And our uh, all school meetings, in addition to seeing if we filled up the tube, we also participate in color wars. So our teams are divided, our school is divided into yellow, blue, or white, and they <laughs> compete for in minute to win it games for the Highland uh, Championship belt. If you want to see some kids get excited over bragging rights, come to one of our all school meetings and see who gets to win the, win the belt. We have buddies classes that we were able to bring back this year post pandemic, uh, which has been great to build connections across our school. And this year, I'll, as I talked about when I get into our school improvement plan, we've been able to implement the zones of regulation across our entire building. So to develop this year's school improvement plan, we utilize a variety of sources of data, both quantitative and qualitative. Two of the biggest quantitative measures that drove our plan were our IAR results and our spring map data. Now our IAR is a lagging indicator, so not getting these results till the fall um, allows us to be able to check to see was our, were we on track with where we thought our growth was when we look at map, we look at AIMSWeb and things like that. So you can see our spring growth uh, in IAR, especially in the area of mathematics, we were, we were really pleased with the level of growth that we saw from our kids. Um, and we knew that area, uh, that reading was an area for us to target. Uh, the grass, I like to say the grass grows where you water it. We've spent a lot of time uh, implementing our bridges, K6, or I'm sorry, K5, and our new math program in sixth grade. So this was, uh, we were excited to see the fruits of our labor in the area of math and knew that reading was an area to dig into. So this is our spring map data from last spring. Again, supported math being our area of strength and reading, seeing still expected growth, but also knowing that if math is outpacing reading growth, that's the area that we want to focus on the most. So these are our two quantitative sources of data in addition to our teacher reflections, our observations within the classroom that drove the development with our instructional leadership team of our school improvement plan for this year. So we have three school improvement goals this year. The first one's in reading. The second one is in uh, social emotional learning with the zones of regulation. And the third's around our culture. So I'll hand it over to Highland Assistant Principal, uh, Mrs. Cristobal, to talk about our third school improvement goal. We'll, we'll go in reverse order here. Talk about how we implemented the happiness advantage. Thank you, Mr. Kraft. Good morning. Um, so, no, good evening. Mm. I apologize for that. <laughs> I'm so used to saying good morning. Um, but our Highland staff has participated in um, various activities that align with our SIP goal number three, which is about establishing and encouraging a culture and climate rooted in positive psychology, you know, based on all the work of Sean Inker. And um, we, our staff had the privilege to uh, participate in team building and team building activities, such as, you know, just um, enjoying the day with each other by sharing pictures on their phone or having a friendly competition in the gym. We did play Hungry Hungry Hippos, um, the human version, 
And things like self-care, just um, really thinking about things that we're grateful for, um, wearing under eye uh, pads in one of our staff meetings, um, and just having gratitude for one another for, and for really the, the job that uh, we, and the responsibility that we have with our students. One of our traditions as well is to um, throw the throwing of the frogs, which is a very <laughs> fun activity during staff meetings, but you see this little frog here, Spark, um, at every staff meeting. Um, our staff members get to throw one or pass one around to someone that is in showing them positivity or that they're grateful for. And so this is a time where our staff members really get to experience that positivity by giving each other a shout out. Um, and our culture team has provided opportunities for our students to start also continue to grow in their leadership skills. One example of that is now our students are leading in the, mo the morning announcements. Our fourth graders are doing an excellent job at, the, at that. Their leadership skills and their unique talents are growing. Um, our students are also invited uh, to hear shout outs from their teachers during our morning Wednesday announcements. And we're excited that at uh, this end of the school year, the students will also get to hear about Spark and his story and how that impacts their learning. So we're very excited by everything that we're doing as to get us to the SIP goal number three. Mr. Craig? As I said, this year we implemented the zones of regulation building wide at the tier one level. The end of last school year, our staff came together uh, and participated in a book study to understand how they wanted to better meet uh, our students' social and emotional needs. The zones of regulation is a program that teaches students how to best identify what zone they're in, what emotion that they're feeling, and then works to build tools on how can they cope with that or how can they get themselves back to the green zone. Uh, Previously, we've used the zones of regulation in a tier two or tier three capacity uh, at Highland, but it really is a program that can be implemented at a tier one level, kindergarten through sixth grade. So at the end of last year, the staff participated in the book study and felt strongly that it would be beneficial to implement. So our school improvement goal number two focuses around that implementation starting uh, early in the fall, monitoring our progress, and the implementation overall has been strong. We've seen students being able to identify what zone they're in and then now we're really into the phase of implementation this first year of students building those tools and being able to recognize what strategies they can use if they are feeling some of those emotions like anger or anxiety and get themselves back to a more regulated spot so uh, we've pr dedicated professional learning time to this at professional learning mondays faculty meetings and now we have resources throughout the building in addition to each one of our classrooms and then our school program program that, or I'm sorry, our school improvement goal that was driven by our instructional leadership team was focused in the area of reading. So really looking at that phonics instruction and those students' students ability to decode words. So really that word recognition uh, piece we found as we went to, into our quantitative data, as we looked at the resources that we were implementing, where were the holes and where were the gaps? Uh, so we have up here, you know, an example of one of the programs that we've used equipped for reading success. Um, words Their Way is another program that our, we have found success with across multiple grade levels. So this is an ongoing conversation and this is something that we continually look, continuously look at data, both at the building level but then also down to the team level and down to the student level, really being able to identify groups of students that are or are not moving and make adjustments based on those gains. Uh, so we just had uh, a professional learning Monday that was building directed today and we reflected on a variety of our school improvement goals to identify areas that have gone well, areas for improvement and to hopefully guide the development of next year's school improvement program. This was our winter data from just this past benchmarking period. So I showed you our spring data that helped the development of these goals and this shows us where we're at. So we're seeing expected growth in the areas of math and reading, continuing to look at down to the individual student level. Are we on track? Where do we need to improve? And you know, what uh, are we Focusing, are we targeting our students um, that are making low growth and what propensity level are they at? What additional supplies or what pedagogical or instructional changes do we need to make for those individual students or those groups of students uh, moving forward to the spring? So we're very excited about where uh, we've, where we started and where we are now and are, are looking forward to seeing what our students can accomplish this spring. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much for being here tonight. Uh, any questions from the board? Well, thank you. Wonderful. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. And for our members of the Student Council, we got a couple of gifts for you. Great job, kids. Way to go. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> All right, listed on tonight's agenda are 10 communications received by the board. Are there any additional communications uh, a board member would like to share at this time? No. That brings us up to our spotlight. The first one up tonight is our staffing considerations. Dr. Vizantis. Uh, all right, good evening. Um, we wanted to spend a little bit of time tonight on just sharing our preliminary um, plans for staffing for the 23-24 school year. And, and really, this is a continuation of our same priorities we've worked on for, for many, many years. This is the, the work that really is coming from our strategic plan and, and our same areas of focus. So this, this first slide is really just that overview, that reminder of our class size targets. We are working toward the lower class sizes across the district. Our targets, um, just to remind everyone and maybe even our, our community, those of you watching, uh, we are striving for 80% of our classrooms in grades K-2 to be at 24 or fewer and 80% of our classrooms in grades three through eight to be at 26 or fewer. Um, we've been very proud though, the reality is we've had more than 90% of our classrooms and we continue to try to increase that percentage and really be at those targets across the district. We wanna bring that relative consistency in that range of class sizes um, across all 13 of our schools. So we're continuing to make progress in that area we want to maintain our quality programs of instruction and again that consistency so there are no we're not recommending changes in in for next year the art music pe library instruction we want to continue that high level of support and services for el learners our dual language program special education program um, intervention supports and again focusing on that I'm um, using that data to help us make staffing decisions so we have the, the equitable opportunities across all of our buildings and that same level of support based on the need at each school. We're continuing with that same, the curriculum development and implementation. Uh, we've seen great um, progress with our professional learning Mondays and our teacher support through our coordinators and instructional coaches. And then obviously, we very carefully review and make those budget considerations and look at the budget considerations. What is our available funding? What additional expenses may we see in the upcoming year in, in light of any changes in um, programming and needs? We look closely at special education, our, the students who participate in outplacements or not participating in a District 58 school. And then what are our what does our grant funding look like as we're putting all of this together for the upcoming year so there are two main areas that I want to highlight tonight where we have identified an increased need for support um, again this is a continuation I don't think our board is surprised when we look at the area of special education our child count increases and has increased 70 students um, we have our children and we're very proud again that we have District 58 students who can attend school within District 58 schools by bringing our students back who may have participated in outplacements and can be um, successfully served, appropriately served in our RISE, our DLP and our BEST programs, our, our excuse me, self-contained special ed programs. So as our students who are in sixth grade now We'll move to seventh grade next year. We want to open a RISE classroom at Herrick Middle School. We would then need a teacher for the seventh grade students. And along with that would be those associated related services. So there'll be an increase in that speech, speech social work, psychologist allocation to support the kids as they move into the middle school. Similarly, we are planning for an increase in staffing for our DLP and BEST programs. Again, as students are either move into the district or are able to transition back into our schools from an outplacement we are planning for that increased teacher need for each of those programs potentially and again tonight i should have stressed this is these are the possibilities we we are very careful in our planning and very conservative in our planning is so let's try to plan for all possibilities and make sure we um, again put everything out there and then really as we get more information we'll be able to much um, 
better define and give much more specifics to our board as to where we are you know, a month from now, two months from now. We, the plan transition, our occupational therapist, that's a continuation as well. There's cost savings with that, as well as cost savings as we have students attend in District 58 schools as opposed to play, paying the outplacement tuition. So we will add three more OT positions. That was part of our plan we um, shared last year. We hired two occupational therapists for this school year, and then the plan was to roll up and continue expanding. The um, the bullet that talks about really increased certified staff to address IA staffing shortages. We have been very creative. As you know, there is a staffing shortage across not just education, but many different professions. And so we've adjusted our model as we're trying to make sure we can properly support kids. And for this year, we were unable to, s to fill some of our instructional assistant positions, and then we basically captured and repurposed the allocations, the dollars for those positions, and hired a certified staff member to support the RISE program and Indian Trail and Hillcrest, um, the DLP program. So we are looking at, again, that recruiting is very important, and at the end of the day, just making sure we can properly support students. It may be supporting through an instructional assistant or multiple instructional assistants, or it may be supporting through a certified staff position, trying to accomplish, um, again, that inclusion, the successful inclusion. And then as, you, as we continue to grow in special education in, in our um, self-contained programs, really we're looking at over 110 students in RISE, DLP, and BEST across six schools, 17 classrooms, and nearly 60 staff members. And so that's become very challenging that we are also planning for that the need, there is the need for the administrative support to really provide that proper oversight to support families, support meetings, support the, the building staff and the programs at each of the schools. Our second area is looking more closely at Herrick Middle School. Um, as you know, Herrick is 650 students. When we look across the district to O'Neill, which is roughly 430 students, just the administrator-student ratio, you know, really is not, it's not an equitable experience. In, and we really want to, at this time, you know, last year you may recall, we added a, a counselor at Herrick. We've added in other areas. We still feel um, that in order to properly support students, we also needed to add an administrative position and assistant principal. And that's, it's really to make sure that we can provide student support, staff support, and parent support at such a large building. The amount of time for, that our administrators spend um, with posit developing positive behavior systems and, and working with their staff on, on discipline and, and meeting with families, meeting with students, um, supporting the instructional improvement, mentoring our teachers. There are various meetings to support student success, and that's you know supporting all this 504 plan students with IEPs. And um, so at this time, that is part of what we're anticipating. That is our recommendation. We also think it's the timing is right in that we are beginning to develop our systems for our team as we prepare for the 678 middle school. As you think of when that transition happens, Herrick will be a building of 950 plus students and so we wanted to put that you know get that team in place and begin working on our systems for a, a definitely a larger middle school mm -hmm. you know and again that, that final bullet really allowing us to um, have, provide a more equitable experience for our students our staff and our families <coughs> This next slide provides a little bit more detail, again, of those possibilities. The 3.5 three, the 3 elementary classroom teachers, that <coughs> is based on meeting our targets in 100% of our classrooms, K-6. Middle school is a little bit more challenging, but there is still an allocation for the middle school. Um, and, and again, until we've just started registration, we would hope to have much better information by April and May to know um, really to, and to make those, those difficult decisions as to 
are we allowing a class of 15 with this if, if every classroom in elementary is meeting the targets we could have classes of 15 16 and lower class sizes which are fantastic but we would have to be able to make sure at the same time we take a look at how does it impact the overall budget where are the priorities and, and make those decisions really when we get more specifics on our enrollment the middle school allocation the 1.0 um, part of that is specific to Herrick where the class sizes still are larger we would want to add a couple of sections um, specifically in the area of science the other part of that decision is foreign language uh, the full year Spanish of course we already have interest from our families really that would warrant an additional two periods um, years ago we and a decision we could make is to cap foreign language and not allow kids who have asked for that offering to get into that course our recommendation is we want kids to have that opportunity we don't want to cap our numbers at this point and let's start recruiting and so that's where some of that 1.0 for the middle school is coming from again the assistant principal which I just spoke to the rise teacher that's for the class that would be moving up to the middle school um, occupational therapist you'll notice the to be determined we really there's a, there's a lot of work ahead in April and May transition meetings decisions about students if to find out where then that ultimately uh, what the programs would look like if there's the need in DLP invest and so we'll have a better idea of like the, the very specific breakdown on psychologist social work um, speech allocations once those meetings have occurred on that right side looking at our budget impact all of these recommendations will be factored into the financial plan for the April board meeting the savings um, there are savings and some of that is supporting our students in district versus paying for out, outplacement tuition some of the savings is due to contracting our own um, or hiring our own occupational therapist versus contracting there's some offset with the unfilled instructional assistant positions and then finally as our team has been talking about and we have shared with the board previously looking very closely at trying to reduce the best we can the, t the amount of time we're taking teachers out of a classroom reduce committees that need for substitutes um, and so there will be some reductions in our committee meetings that then could help offset with some associated substitute teacher costs <coughs> And before I go on to next steps, because I feel like that was a lot of information, are there <laughs> maybe maybe I pause here <laughs> if there are questions on those last two slides, or, or I can. Well, I guess it's I a seg go. segue into the the second bullet. Um, when you look at like what's going to kind of be brought forward to the FAC for for discussion, how do you kind of envision that deliverable? And you know, we're going to see actual dollar amounts, or how do we kind of? quantify those offsets and additional costs I, I was gonna say you might watch, I was gonna say I feel like it's gonna be a summary you're not gonna have the, the specific that level of specificity and when we bring the the uh, financial the five-year financial plan format um, as we do annually to the board uh, we include and put all of this into that calculation um, you know the adjustments out and the savings of not having that outplacement piece and then the staffing ads um, and adjustments as, as we go through all of that so that is that gets wrapped into the assumptions of the financial plan um, that the board will see it in, in April yeah, so but Steve, to answer your question directly what you'd see in that financial plan when we bring that to the FAC in April and then to the board you'll see the actual number of FTE in there how much that cost a uh, year you'll be able to look at last year and then this year uh, to make a comparison what the board will likely see is that obviously an increase in FTE whenever you're bringing we continue to bring this model where instead of outplacing students at um, you know SACID or um, specialized schools bringing those students in that's going to increase your FTE number the um, dollar amount though will decrease because obviously um, we believe that it's best for kids in general but it's also a big savings to the school district in terms of doing those things on their own when you can OTPT are good examples of that but you would see those final FTE numbers with the associated dollar amounts in that five-year financial plan as Jane alluded to though one of the things that um, this is the highest level making sure that all of you know the, the class size targets would be met of course decisions get made as that budget you know continues to get fine-tuned but yes yeah, Steve you would see those dollar amounts okay I, I guess I'm just 
want us to be cautious that we're not just kind of seeing the end results or, you know, we kind of have some um, some benefits and the TIF rolling out where we could say we can afford this, but I guess I just want to understand, you know, this, this delta, right? If we had to put a, a price tag on just these potential increases and not have it rolled up, you know, spread across, like we have some benefits in the TIF and other things that mm -hmm. kind of allow us to have more funds, but like, what is the actual dollar amount for the increases that we we kind of propose in April? If yeah, that, if that makes sense. Because I, I I I guess Todd, I just want us to be cautious that we're not just saying, hey, we have these offsets so we can afford that. But you know, how much are we actually adding? Because I I, I just don't want us to kind of go down the um, the path of where we're always adding without challenging the numbers. Because I I don't know, we're, we're adding to Herrick, right? And, kind of see some of these things that I, I think they all make sense but I just want us to make sure that we understand what that dollar amount is for these increases and yeah. not just kind of have it wrapped up in a in a five-year plan absolutely yes. or like a direct offset versus like those 70 plus students that may be already somewhere else but we bring them in that's a direct offset right mm -hmm. we're bringing it we're we're taking people out of you know students out of outplacement and we're bringing them internally that's a different um, that's a different type of number than yeah, and, and when, I think just when, we're, kind of uh, when we're adding in something new into, into to Herrick, for example, that, that may come from, from somewhere else. But like bringing somebody in from right. SAS yes. internally, that's a, dip, that's a direct offset. We're, we're moving these kids from here to here. So we're getting rid of this expense and we're replacing mm -hmm. it with that expense. I think that's, that's one avenue right. as opposed to like what, what you were talking about. With the yeah, and I think, you know, the thing, overall yeah. impact on the budget slide, there's, there's five bullets. So, you know, what I would like to see is, you know, what are the dollar amounts associated with each of those bullets? If, if we have an offset, what is that dollar amount? If we're going to increase for middle school or whatever, any of these, you know, 10 bullet points of potential increases, what is that dollar amount? Sure. So we could actually, because um, I think right now it's, to me, it's kind of feeling like it's just overall out of our 72 million or whatever it is budget, it works, but how much should we add and how much should we save in the process? Yes, yeah, absolutely. So we can show you that in, in one of the numbers, in, uh, especially in terms of the students who are receiving their services outside the district versus inside the district, you get that difference in tuition, right? And, and so tuition is a great uh, thing to look at. But what we'll do, just like we did last year and the year before that, prior to making any hiring recommendations with any of these, we would obviously run this through the FAC, make sure that everything is in the financial plan and make sure that we have those uh, answers to your questions. Thank you, Steve. I really appreciate um, your questions and your concerns. I, I share them with you. Um, and I just want you to know that I, I appreciate you bringing them up. And um, I, I trust you and Darren to, to suss this out. Well, you, you, you could trust Darren. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I look forward to, to getting feedback from, from you guys at the uh, next uh, regular meeting. Um, I have an easier question. And mine is um, regarding administrative support in our middle schools. Um, following the transition of sixth graders over. Okay. And so the projected enrollment at Herrick, you're stating, is 950 plus. Mm -hmm. um, O'Neill is going to be considerably less. Like, wh where do you ballpark that? So I said another two rooms. 650. Mm -hmm. okay. So would you say that the for both schools with their with their future projected enrollment, do you, would you say that they they are um, their administrator to student ratio is consistent with other middle schools in DuPage County? I can answer. Yes. You want me to hey, jump no, in? Yes, so, we um, just looked at, yeah. I, we're under right now, which you would see across DuPage County. So, for instance, you know, I'll use my kids' middle school for as an example. 300 students uh, at that middle school. The staffing that we're proposing for Herrick, current staffing of 650, would be the same that my kids have in a school of 300. And so, we still do a lot with uh, less. Um, now, one of the things I think you can anticipate as sixth graders roll up into these, um, you know, we will continue to look at this model and make it equitable across our two middle schools, but as you're decreasing enrollment in the elementary schools and increasing that enrollment at the um, two middle schools, the administrative support at your elementary schools becomes less of a need, and then you right. shift that support to the um, 
you know, that staff neutral option that we were talking about. So for instance, some schools right now have assistant principals. Some would likely keep those in that model. And I want to be careful that I don't get, get too far ahead. But you know, obviously, like a bigger school like Leicester is still going to require support. However, some of those other schools that might be getting assistant principal support now, when you take off the six grades at those two schools, like a Highland or perhaps even a Kingsley, you're not going to need that assistant principal support because that would put that in line with buildings like what you currently have right now, Hillcrest or Pierce Downer. And if you remember, it wasn't too long ago when Hillcrest and Pierce Downer both had assistant principals, but through that redistribution and making sure that we have an equitable approach and giving the kids the support that they need, we then shifted that administrative support around. And so we will continue that process as we go through. Uh, so we certainly see in the future a reduction at our elementary schools, but an increase at our uh, middle schools. Right now, this increase on the table, as Jane said, is kind of twofold. One, it, it creates the equitable uh, experience for both of our middle schools. As we continue, though, to build up at Herrick, um, you will likely see more administrative uh, support needed at that school, especially when you have 950. So some of the models that we're looking at um, for, for the new Herrick would be uh, like Rotolo Middle School in Batavia that has about 1,000 students, right, looking at how they're staffing that. Some of the other bigger middle schools in District 204, those, those kinds of things. But how we stack up against other schools in the county, we tend to have less administrative support at our buildings than you would see in, in other districts. We can certainly get a comparison, though, uh, as we go forward with this, and we will certainly continue to do that. Right. And, quick, oh. Yeah, thanks. And just no, another question, quick question. The foreign language, so that, that was kind of news to me that we're preventing people from wanting to take a class. It's that's years ago. It's a, you, you know, that ago. is an option, you know, and as we were weighing, you know, doing the pros and cons and talk discussing, you know, if when we put it all together and look at what are those priorities and where we are with the budget, an option could be to cap and okay. we not let kids in. We are not recommending that we and for the last several years we've expanded and we've we've offered it to kids who and all students who have asked for that opportunity okay. all right thank you and so we want to continue that so that's i'm going far back there <laughs> no but I, I think that's a good thing to bring up because one of the reasons we're in this current prioritization remember combination classes that were done you know five or six years ago that was something that you know we were adamant about and the community was about doing away with those and and you know not making that forced choice at the middle school uh, that's something also that we've embraced over the last uh, several years that we want to continue to keep well less of a discussion on the budget part of it I just want to note something that uh, makes me happy and that is the uh, talk about committee reductions uh, I, I think that that, I mean, we have a lot, and we've, we've had a heavy need in this district for a long time, but one of the things that we spent a lot of time talking about when, when there was the challenge of, of, of trying to find time for personal de or professional development, we looked at adding those Mondays in, and one of the things we were really, look, really looking to do was to reduce the time that the mm -hmm. teachers were out of the classroom. Then we got hit by COVID and, and a lot of other things. So um, to see us moving into that step where we have f fewer disruptions in the classroom, more time with their their teachers I think is is something I really look forward to so that's in here and I just want to take a moment and and um, and point that out because I, I like Thank to you. see that one other point of the budget and then um, we'll move in that we continue to have um, debates about in, in our administrative team is right now when you look at the budget we have a lot of con or I shouldn't say a lot but three to four positions of contingency and we've always budgeted those positions of contingency in the event we get a class size, you know, that would grow over the summer and that we would have to utilize that contingency, right? So if we continue down a path where we're looking at, you know, really trying to hit all those targets right after registration, then what you would see is you would see a trade-off in the overall budget with less contingency if you're already putting that money into those classroom positions, right? We'd still always have to have some level of contingency in our budget, right? That That's just good planning because you never know what's going to bring up. The question is, if you're going to already meet the targets in the, on the one side of the budget, you won't need as much contingency on the other side. So that is something that we're continuing to fine-tune as well because you don't want to account for both of the positions on both sides of the budget because it will inflate the total number. Okay, so as we move on to our next steps then in April, we will conduct the reduction in force, which will be 
uh, relatively small compared to prior years, really looking at just our part-time certified staff. And that reason for that is we, we need to confirm what their FTE are. They may be a 0.5 teacher this year, might be 0.7 next year, or a reduction, you know, we could go either direction. Um, our classroom teaching positions, we, we do not riff all first year teachers, nor are districts supposed to riff all first time year teachers. It's really gonna be classroom staff. Once we know we need the position, we would have hired them back. Um, we are not going to riff the positions that we already know we need and are hard to fill, resource, psychologists, social workers, so those would not be a reduction. Um, and then really in our part-time instructional assistants, we would not, any of our full-time instructional assistants that we recruited and hired this year, we want to keep. Um, and then similarly, that part-time is really once we know where their positions are, we'll offer them a position back. Um, I've already mentioned really, really reviewing the impact of these additions and the reductions at the Financial Advisory Committee in April, as well as bringing that information back to the board meeting in April. Um, the next few months then, we're very busy with registration, confirming enrollment. Some of the postings have gone up. We'll continue to put postings up, begin our hiring, our recruiting and hiring. Um, refine our schedules for our specialists, art, music, PE, teacher librarians, as well as related service. So that's psychologist, social work, speech. And that really is what's going to drive then the, the specifics of, of having a better number on what that, the FTE is the staffing recommendation will be for next year. Um, and then, as always, I mean, the ongoing review and refinement will be continue on from now all the way through to that first day of school as we are um, preparing for the upcoming year and preparing for our students. So just a quick summary recap. Again, this is high level, intended to be high level for tonight. Um, the recommendations are a continuation. They are align in alignment with our goals, the priorities established through our strategic plan. Again, similarly, we've been working several years on these same goals. So there's no really any new change or shift in um, our recommendations. We'll continue to gather this information and more information over the next several months. We'll look carefully at the budget constraints and consider um, obviously making sure that we are making, we have fiscally responsible decisions. At the end of the day, when we get down to really that prioritization, which is always challenging, it's, you know, we, it's very difficult and you will hear, I wish we had more of this position or that position or I wish we could spend money on X. Um, we, we just can't add in every area. We will continue to make decisions based on what we feel is best for our students to offer them the high quality education that they deserve and that they, we feel they should receive in District 58. So with that, any other questions? <laughs> All right. Questions, comments? Thanks, Jane. Thank, Thank you. Jane. Thank you very much. Okay. We have two spotlights tonight. Our second one is on the referendum update and the middle school concept designs. Dr. Russell gets the big podium tonight. Yeah, I've been down here in a long time. It's nice to hello, everyone. <laughs> um, well, First, uh, we have several people uh, in the audience that are going to join me up in the presentation here. So we have representatives from White & Company that will talk about some of the conceptual designs and then also our construction management firm, Billy & Andrews, will also be here to talk about kind of the timing of the projects. Just to give the board a 50,000 overview foot or, you know, overview of where we're at. Tonight is about the conceptual design process. So if you remember back when we were doing the referendum, you saw those rough sketches of the schools with boxes and places, right? Well, the boxes have gotten a lot more defined and that's what we're excited to share with you tonight in terms of where are all these things going to go. Again, this is more just that conceptual design. We wanna hear the board's feedback. We wanna make sure that we haven't missed anything from the Board of Education. Tonight's also gonna to be primarily focused on our middle school projects, Herrick in particular because of the scope of the work. As we get closer to some of the elementary projects, we'll be doing a very similar presentation with you. Assuming everything goes well tonight, and by the way, we've met with both middle school staffs and, and had conversations with them and taken their feedback. We've also met with the office staffs of each building and taken their feedback to the architect. Then the next step in the design process is schematic drawings, where those conceptual designs get a little bit more fine-tuned. And then um, also, 
as we head into April and, and likely the May meeting, then having a conversation with the board in terms of the budget, where we're at, and what we think the square footage estimates are going to cost us based on the priorities that we have. So tonight is more of a conceptual design, and just like we talked about staffing, we'll be fine-tuning that budget and bringing it back in um, April and uh, likely May. So with that, let's go ahead and dive in here. So as we talk about the project goals, when we went in front of the community, we said, here are the things that this referendum is going to cover. And so again, just reminding everyone, the project goals here are to create secure vestibules in all of our 13 schools, provide HVAC or enhance the HVAC at all of our schools. I say enhance because two of our schools, LCR and Bel Air, already have existing HVAC systems. We'd obviously be enhancing those when at the 11 locations we'd be completely redoing all those or adding to it implement sixth through eighth grade middle schools, and then of course address critical infrastructure. What does that mean? Well, we've talked about that in two um, ways throughout the referendum. If you remember that flyer that we sent out, all those little orange dots, that's the critical infrastructure. So what does that include? That includes things like addressing all of the bathroom facilities throughout all 13 of our schools. That includes addressing those critical maintenance projects in years one through eight. Building envelope might be a great example, or tuck pointing uh, might be another great example. So those things that were called for in years one through eight, or as we uh, illustrated, those orange dots on those handouts or, or those mailers that we sent home. We had great community visioning sessions. Um, back in January, we brought in our staff and we also then brought in the community. And we did these on the same night, very well received evenings. I want to thank our partners uh, from White and Company and Bully and Andrews for all the planning that went into uh, these. They're not unlike the process that we're going to recommend later on in the meeting for strategic planning. People came in excited. They wanted to make sure that they gave their feedback and, and that they got a chance to see kind of initially what we were thinking. And very much those two sessions helped shape in the survey also helped shape what we're going to present to you tonight. And so here are some of the guiding principles we took away from those meetings, and then White and Company will come and show you um, how we put pen to paper with that. So we want to make sure that we accommodate flexibility and agility in our spaces. One of the themes you're going to hear us talk about is who knows what classroom spaces will look like 30, 40, or 50 years down the road. So how can we make sure that we're flexible in our thinking and adds on in our thinking so that we can plan for the unknown down the road? We also want to f uh, foster choice and independence. So when kids are learning, do they have the ability to move around? Do they have the ability to be independent? Um, we want to promote safe and sustainable environments. That safety was a huge piece of what we talked about through the referendum process. And then again, being good stewards of the environment as we go through these projects, how do we make sure that we're creating sustainable spaces? You'll hear some ideas that we have tonight for water retention in Herrick's uh, field as we're talking about building parking lots, right? So every time we do some of these, how can we also make sustainability a, a, a key factor in our planning? We also want to create warm and welcoming spaces to learn. We got a lot of feedback from our staff. We got a lot of feedback from the community about the importance of things like natural lighting when you're building these things, especially at Herrick where you have to now make interior rooms with some of the spaces. How do we do like what you would have seen in 99 where even though you may have new interior spaces, how do you get that natural lighting in there so you still feel like you're on the outside? And then of course, honor tradition in timeless spaces. We got a lot of feedback from our community on what they like and quite frankly what they don't like, in, in, including our staff. Um, you know, so when we were having conversations about, you know, what should furniture look like in a new classroom? And, and they were presented with choices in, in terms of more traditional looking things that, that are still modern versus maybe some of the newer things you would see, soft seating and, and bench seating and things like that. It was clear from the feedback we got from our staff and our community that they'd like more traditional approaches, uh, still had that flexibility and agility, but maybe not all those modern looks that might go out of fad in five to ten years. So those are some big takeaways that we had. And then of course those timeless spaces uh, comes back to the first bullet where we're talking about flexibility and agility. Again, really planning for the future that none of us are quite sure what that's going to look like. So how do we make sure that we build classrooms to have the highest internet capacity? How do we make sure that we're making those spaces flexible in case we wanted to you know, use them for different purposes down the road? So with that, I'm going to bring up Craig and Steve from White and & Company, and we're going to first talk about our two middle schools and what we're thinking.
Dr. Russell, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen of the board, thanks for having us here today. My name is Craig Siepka. Uh, I'm uh, shepherding the design process along with Steve Scher, my colleague. Uh, Amy Tiberi could not be here today, so she sends her regards. Uh, she is still our project manager. Uh, she will be back next time, so fear not. Um, I'm just here <laughs> as a substitute. So, uh, With us today also is Peter Kuhn from um, uh, Bully Andrews. And at the end of the, the design conversation that we have, he's going to come up here, talk a little bit about the implementation, uh, some major milestone dates and things that we're considering as we go through the process. So with that said, I'm going to start us off with, uh, with, um, with O'Neill over here. the wrong way there we go all right so just to get you um, oriented uh, I'm, I'm sure you've seen some of these drawings again but it's been a while and you guys are very busy so just uh, what we're looking at over here is a uh, is a site plan of the O'Neill campus north is up uh, 59th Street uh, to the to the north over there and then we have uh, our main entrances and uh, vent entrances and so forth identified so that uh, you can see what's going on around the building. What you see over here are um, scattered uh, around the perimeter of the building are a series of smaller additions that we're contemplating and recommending that are pretty much in keeping with um, some of the things that you saw during the referendum process. Um, and they correspond Coincidentally, here's the existing floor plan with improvements that we're recommending on the inside. So going around from the top, uh, from the northwest corner, moving our, our way, uh, around the building, um, we have a new main entrance located. Does this have, uh, let's try this. New main entrance that we're suggesting right over here that corresponds to uh, some new construction, main office, student support services, and the like. Uh, included in that, as you heard Dr. Russell say, uh, is a, a very intentional uh, series of events that happen as visitors come into the, into the building. So it'll be a nice, safe, and secure entrance, uh, consistent with what we're contemplating for uh, some of the elementary schools, uh, state-of-the-art security. Uh, and then um, really over to the, to, the, to the opposite end, looking at renovating the uh, library and media center. Uh, we have a whole heck of a lot of conversations that need to happen with regards to that with your staff. Um, we'll get to that in just a moment. And then in between, um, what we're calling a, a collaboration commons area. And the, the largest of such, uh, such venues that we have um, kind of scattered throughout the building. Allow us to give uh, that, that ability for choice and independence to the students. Allow them movement during the course of the day. Provide flexible space that can be uh, rearranged and, and uh, from, from period to period, semester to semester, year to year, however you want to use it. Um, and again, along with the, the library media center, a lot of conversation need, needs to go into there to, to figure out how to equip it. Uh, make sure that it's usable for the teachers and the staff. We certainly don't want to be doing something that uh, would not be uh, in keeping with how you're educating your kids and not use it. So um, certainly that's going to be uh, a big part of the conversation going forward. So that's, that's really the main area right over there. We're looking at giving the main entrance a little bit more prominence and a facelift, I guess, if you will. Um, really celebrate the entrance to the building, how it addresses the community, um, and, and so forth. Moving down the hallway then, um, we're, uh, let's see, to the south, in this area right over here, we come across another smaller commons, but around that commons uh, is a new main, uh, main gymnasium or competition gymnasium for, uh, for the kids uh, and the teachers. Uh, it is also contemplated as a tornado shelter, as we had talked about during the referendum process, uh, certainly equipped with storage, toilets, and all those things that need to happen um, uh, as far as code requirements go for that. And then on the opposite side of the ca that commons area, or on either side of the commons area, is a fitness area uh, that, uh, um, that we're suggesting be placed between the auxiliary gym and the main gymnasium. And then on the other side, uh, we're calling FACS, and a potentially a demonstration kitchen. We just wrapped up a conversation with uh, the leadership group um, in the district office last week, where we introduced them to uh, our food service consultant who will be helping us uh, look at some of the details that go into not only the kitchen servery area that is on the south end of the, the cafe or the dining area, but also to help us uh, equip and design um, 
you know, the uh, nuances and all the details that go into the culinary arts program that you have here, potentially with a demonstration kitchen um, that we have to have further conversations about. Again, that would allow us uh, different opportunities for the students and the teachers, um, you know, with regards to that subject matter. Moving then down the hallway again to the, uh, to the east, um, we'll come across another commons area that we're contemplating be themed in the steam genre. So we do have, uh, an exp uh, well, the art room, we can't call it an art room, right? Uh, we can't call it an art room. Okay, you can. okay. <laughs> all right. <laughs> all right. But we're thinking about having maybe the art room on this side uh, across the hall uh, from the science lab expen expansion and renovation. So some opportunities for collaboration between those two departments, um, some sharing of resources, and uh, certainly with the commons area over there, some spill out activities, places to demonstrate student projects, and all of that uh, will be a kind of a nice opportunity uh, that is not really afforded in the hallways uh, of the facility right now. Then scattered, uh, kind of looping back around to the main entrance, just a series of uh, improvements and additions, both from an infrastructure standpoint and a finished standpoint, uh, kind of rounds out the improvements that we're, we're thinking about here uh, for the O'Neill campus. On the second floor, uh, then again, a couple science labs and, um, and then some uh, similar improvements that we talked about on the first floor with regards to infrastructure. Um, and um, an additional classroom space. In all, I think we have about 27 classroom or instructional spaces that we're considering with uh, the science lab spaces as well as the art and music uh, in addition to those. So um, really a nice complement of, uh, of, uh, of spaces for the kids. Looking forward to really getting into the details. As I said, uh, we're meeting weekly with the leadership group. Yeah, each one of those weeks, there's a different theme uh, we finished up the food service and culinary, culinary arts uh, discussion, or started it. We did not finish it. We have a long way to go. Uh, we're we're going to be coming back on Thursday uh, of this week to talk a little bit about the wellness spaces, the gymnasiums, uh, as well as the locker rooms uh, and those commons areas that I mentioned. Uh, then we have a whole, again, series of um, scheduled meetings in the coming weeks that will take us through all the contemplated renovations and all the specialty spaces, uh, as well as infrastructure, and, uh, and, finish, and a look at the finishes. Eventually, we'll be coming back to you to share um, the details, the specific details of that as we continue those conversations. They are not one and done. They are a series of conversations. We're constantly making adjustments all the way through uh, schematic design, design development, and then into the detailed drawings that uh, Peter and his colleagues are going to be using uh, to solicit proposals from the uh, from uh, interested bidders. So that takes care of O'Neill. Is there any questions before I turn it over to Steve? Yes. Can you go back to the first slide. <laughs> Tracy, real quick before we get there. Uh, okay. Just a couple of things I want to highlight from a visioning perspective and, and from the meetings that we've had with our staff members. Um, we're, one of the things that we've heard uh, through, our, through our food bid process is, you know, do the current kitchens have capacity to then satellite out to the elementary schools? And so at both middle schools, you're going to see that increased kitchen size to not only accommodate uh, more students, but also to potentially satellite out there. One of the things that we're also anticipating is that the main gyms will double as a storm shelter, given the number of kids that we'll have in here. And so you will see that there will be bathrooms. The T represents a toilet room. It took me a while to get that as well. So those are all um, bathrooms as well. And if that's a storm shelter, you would have to have that uh, in there. So that's also something that we're thinking of. In terms of these commons and, and collaborative spaces, one of the things we're trying to do at both middle schools, especially Herrick, when they were built in the 50s, is to really you know, widen those hallways out a little bit right now as you're accommodating more students. So these can be flexible spaces to not only help during passing periods, but also if you wanted to take your kids outside and, and work on a collaboration thing, you, you do have a little bit more room. If you've ever been to Hubble Middle School in Wheaton, that school is built around that design. Um, this would allow us a lot more uh, flexibility in terms of our planning. But certainly you hit the key components here that we're talking about, and uh, we appreciate White. Um, this is several you know, iterations of this, and uh, we appreciate their, their feedback on there. The other thing that we wanted to be very conscious of is making sure that we have room to expand. 
So we've spent a lot of time with Matt Gravala and Brian Kobo, the assistant principal, and then Sam and Gleema and Dave Norman, the principal over at Herrick as well, making sure that we did have room to grow in the event. You had a little uh, you know, boom in population or, or maybe a bigger class here or there. So we do feel like at both middle schools that you're going to see, we do have room to grow in these current conceptual designs. The one thing I would caution you as well is um, these are conceptual still. So there might be a line that doesn't show that the room has a fully closed uh, you know, room or things like that. Those will all come in future conversations. But right now, we're just, again, building these out to be as flexible as possible. So please don't interpret like in the science rooms. You know, right now you might see that, well, does that mean that they're all open to one another? No, it doesn't. But again, just showing how they could be if that's something that the board and the um, you know, staff thought was a good idea. Okay. My question was um, for O'Neill, um, I didn't see a key, so I apologize if this is, but the color, the color codes, the color rooms, is that just to note that it's something, it's, it's, changing what it used to be so it's going from like it was not a science room before and it's becoming a science space Do yeah uh, actually a very good question and it's really a combination of when both when i look at it, two pages i have to scroll back and forth to see what was it before and oh what is it now yeah. so i'm at so is that what it's for yeah uh really it, it's, it's it's a combination of renovations or new and or new construction so when you look at the science labs uh, back in that area there, there are science labs there right now uh, but there's I think a couple of them with some additional ancillary spaces where we're um, kind of reorienting the direction adding some square footage to accommodate uh, program growth and expansion of those and and that's what you're looking at so in this area here what's in the dotted line that's really the new construction area that's what you saw in yellow on the site plan that uh, we started the conversation with and then uh, in addition to that there's a series of renovations uh, with the existing construction that round out that entire space. What helped me, Tracy, when I was working with the architects is what you see in white up here pretty much stays as is. Anything that you see in a different color will get work. That doesn't mean that the white areas won't get work, but that, that footprint really isn't changing. So where you see classroom seven, for example, north of the courtyard, that's a current classroom space that will keep its current footprint. Doesn't mean that it's not necessarily gonna get work like paint or a door, but we're not doing anything drastic there. When you would see classrooms 12, 13, and 14, those are current science labs. So that's why you see a change in color there. Okay, and, and so anywhere where you see just a white, you know, block, that is pretty much going to stay status quo. Another thing that we're working on, in particular at both schools, is we talked about that middle school concept where you see schools within a school. And so when you look at the second floor of O'Neill here, most of this is going to remain kind of in its current spot, especially classrooms 25, 26, 27, 20, 21, and 22. That was the 90s edition, right? So it wouldn't make sense to completely redo that area. But if you look at this model, what we're able to accomplish is basically an entire grade level on its own. So one of the options that we're looking at is that might be a very good spot to put our new sixth graders so you get that school within a school, something that we talked a lot about. And so that's something that we're looking at too. Classroom 15 up there is going to change because that's your current art room. And the new proposal we're talking about moving that downstairs. So that's why you see that in color. Okay, so so from on the second floor, it's Ooh. really not change it's not even breaking down walls. It looks like it's literally the same footprint inside the walls as Correct. Well. You're not changing the footprint drastically. Um, the science labs would obviously be completely redone. Classroom 15 would see a little bit of a different footprint, but not much because that's the current art room. Uh, you'd be adding that office space up there, but for the most part, the second floor, besides the cosmetic renovations that you go through, like the bathrooms, for instance, will be redone, um, you know, the paint and all that, that pretty much stays the way it is. Okay, then um, instead of waiting till the end, I guess specifically for O'Neill, I would ask, um, you know, I, I love that you're gathering input from the staff. But they really, and they, because they really are the boots on the ground. Um, without getting too far in the weeds, has there been anything like an aha moment where you're like, "Wow, I, I didn't, we didn't even think of that." Like, could you just maybe throw us a couple ideas, or like talk about some of the things that they are passionate about? Yeah. So um, one big thing that I, um, you know, I, I know is important but volume and how we're you know 
keeping track of how voice carries, especially uh, you know at Eric and you know if you're putting a classroom next to the band room, you got to be a little more careful about that. So staff are certainly concerned about the noise level. Um, enough bathrooms and making sure those bathrooms are accessible has been another thing that we've been talking about. I think one of the things at the middle school that is is both a blessing and a curse is you know depending on the model that you deploy. So if you deploy more of a traditional junior high model, you hear a lot of people saying, gosh, wouldn't it be great if all the science rooms could just be in one row, right? And then others say, no, 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 in middle school, we want grade levels clustered together. So trying to find that happy medium of the best of both worlds there, I think is very, very important. Um, but certainly we have gotten a lot of feedback around the entrances. I think one of our big ahas is that the staff are really encouraging us, and this is something that was in the works too, on how do we make sure that we have a separate event entrance that we can close off. So not only can that be a revenue generator for the district on weekends, but would also give us the ability at night to close off the school and make it easier for our parents who are coming to sporting events and things like that. So we're getting great ideas um, from our, our staff, um, especially when we talked about things like science labs. It was quite clear, because we were looking at different options, where you can run things through the ceiling and have kids pull them down, or you can have them on the outside of their rooms. It was, the community and the staff were adamant. There's no way in the middle school setting we want something where they're pulling them down. Uh, we want them on the sides, right? And so that's some really good feedback. It might seem like a no-brainer to someone, but you know, there, there really have been good feedback sessions with our staff where they're really helping inform uh, these decisions. When we met with the office staff, where are we gonna put um, the staff members to manage not only visitor flow, but student flow? Once kids are in, how are we gonna manage that and, and really going through that? So we've had some really good conversations to this point. Okay, I, I, I know this goes without saying, but I was just in the high school building and was at a parent meeting, a, a staff member was talking about something with the gyms. Like, oh, you know, we thought that by doing this, we were gonna have all this space. And they cut, they said, we, we brought this up before and so, I know we can't eliminate that and there's always going to be a Monday morning quarterback, but I guess I just want to make sure that we're totally fielding there's there's no wrong answer or whatever and, and taking it, the, their ideas because it, it's, it's they're the ones in the building. Yeah, so. and, and I would even add to that. So, you know, a lot of our stakeholders are District 99 stakeholders. Did yeah. we collect any lessons learned or feedback from now that people are actually in the building and experiencing the great work? You know, there's going to be some Monday morning quarterback. <laughs> yeah. So a couple things to that point. Um, in order to ensure that we are getting feedback from staff at every turn, not only do we do the visioning sessions, but as we go through these conceptual designs, both the Herrick staff were given a meeting where we went through all of these and they got to pick it apart and, and share with us what they liked, what they didn't, what did we miss, and, and we really got a lot out of those meetings. I then had a separate meeting for the just the office staff that would include the nurses, the secretaries, the you know, the, the principals, the assistant principal, all of that. Then they got a chance to look at specifically the office. As we go through, and then we say, okay, we're comfortable with where the science labs are gonna go, we're comfortable with where the gymnasium is gonna go. Then we're calling them almost user group meetings where we bring a representative group of science teachers together and say, okay, before we finalize this design, and Craig had alluded to it a little bit in the library as well, how are we bringing staff along the whole way so when we get done with this project, staff go, I don't know why someone didn't ask me this a long way, because if they did, I would have told them to do this and not this, right? And so that is something that's very important. And also from a conceptual design. While we love all of our buildings in District 58, we do hear feedback, especially around the open concepts of why are these buildings designed that way, right? And so that's something that we're really trying to prevent by making sure we do things like this and that we're constantly engaging our staff. But as we get closer into the final design, so let's say for the facts firm, we're gonna bring in the facts teachers or the science teachers and, and really hear from them and then bring it back to the board as well. Okay. So we continue to get all those different filters so we end up with the best product. Okay, I know you're not going to be able to um, capture everybody, but I know that each one of them has a different lens that they're looking through mm -hmm. on it. And so, um, and a lot of times with these groups, I don't know, on the councils that I used to sit on, it's a lot of the same people that volunteer to go to it. So I just want to make sure that the people that don't volunteer to go to those meetings also have a way, even if it's not showing up to those visioning, that they have an avenue to provide feedback. 
that they if they don't if they don't make it to one of your meetings, I guess. And also with 99 to just kind of keep going with that point. Not to drill that one. No, but, but that's one of the reasons what was so intriguing about partnering with White and Company again, right? They did the 99 yeah. work, so they know what was well received in 99 and maybe some things that weren't so well received after the fact, right? So those are those are things that are important to us. We also have examples from Lester and Pierce Downer, right? What lessons did we learn mm -hmm. in those editions that people really liked or perhaps that they you know, wish we would have done differently? And so really getting that input. And then of course, taking field trips. So I myself have been able to walk every area of North and South High School to get some ideas, right? Mm -hmm. But then also going to you know places like North Shore 112, that's worked with White, that's had a lot of construction. Um, just right next door in Lyle, they have a brand new school. Going to all of those facilities and learning why certain decisions had to be made. Like I will tell you right now, one of the things that I think our community just has to be prepared for, if our gyms serve as storm shelters, what a wonderful thing, right? It's a great safety thing where you can get everybody in there. One of the downsides to a storm shelter is you don't get those big, beautiful glass windows that span the whole gymnasium because it's a storm shelter. Yeah. Well, when they built the storm shelter next door in Lyle, for instance, the community maybe wasn't as aware of that. And so people walked into the gym and they go, why didn't they put more windows in here? And nobody really knew that answer. And so those are things that are at the top of our mind as well that we want to make sure as we're going through some of these decisions that we're also informing the public why we made those decisions. Okay, thank you, sorry. Anyone else? All right, great. All right, let's move on to Herrick. I'll bring Steve up here and he can take you through the same uh, set of drawings. Steve? Thank you, Craig. Thank you, Dr. Russell. Hello, everybody. Happy to share with you the same conceptual update at Herrick Middle School. Um, we'll do the same. We'll start with the site and we'll walk through the conceptual plans. Uh, we skewed this site a little bit just so the building is orthogonal on your screen, but you could see um, Ogden Avenue. Ooh, look at that. Ogden Avenue is actually running diagonally there on, on the right of the screen. Um, so we kind of shifted north here just so it's easier to read. Um, but a lot of great feedback on the site at Herrick from the administration, um, but also the staff and community. Everybody um, is well versed on the challenges and opportunities that the Herrick site offers. Um, so when we're looking at the site improvements, of course, we're thinking about the increase in parking that we need, just bringing sixth grade over, um, but also thinking how we can better accommodate after school activities, knowing that the gym is proposed on the south end of the site or the south east side of the site. Um, but also knowing any time we could separate buses and car traffic is a win for any school site. Um, it just makes pickup drop off much more efficient, much more safer. Um, so we're thinking about that, um, but trying to accomplish all of that without really sacrificing too much of the wonderful play space and field space that you have. Um, so with that, this is sort of the conceptual strategy for the site at Herrick. Um, what you see in the orange color are the proposed additions around the building. Um, we'll take a deeper dive into that when we look at the plans. Um, but really using that east, southeast corner of the site for um, bus pickup and drop off separate from car traffic um, dropping off on the northwest side of the site. Also finding a way to um, get an access road um, that connects Middog to this parking. Um, so knowing that not all 12, 13, 14 buses are going to be dropping off at the same time, this gives many more options for how buses approach the site depending on where they're coming from. Um, and also, like I said, separates that drop off from the car drop off. Um, and then at pickup, buses would queue in this lot in that corner, um, obviously load the students and then discharge to their, to their routes. And then that lot for after school activities would be striped so it also doubles as after school parking for any events happening um, in the gym. So a um, lot more options for buses to approach and leave the site, separating cars and buses, um, but then also getting increased parking for staff and events on the site too. Steve, before we go to that, I, sure. I do want to just pause here and just caution anyone watching at home and then the school board as well. Of all the things that we're proposing, this is the one that is the most out of our control, meaning that this has to go through the proper process with the village. 
And so what we're showing you right now, and of course, you know, we have talked to the village, we, we have talked to our community and tried to incorporate as many ideas. This has not gone through traffic and parking yet. This is not a village approved plan. This would be the conceptual design that we're bringing forward to the village but we think it meets a lot of the requirements that we know will be there and what our community told us. And so when you're looking at this, when we talk to the neighbors, you know, getting that bus traffic out of the neighborhood and, and decoupling that. So White did a nice job with this proposal. We also heard not only from our physical education teachers, but from really everybody involved, you have to keep as much green space as you possibly can, not only for physical education, but just in general terms. This option does that for us. We also heard, could you utilize Ogden Avenue more? This option certainly does that. The fire department, we know, wants an access road between Middaw and Saratoga. This option does that. What this option still is going to require is along Linscott Avenue between the parking lot and Ogden Avenue. You do have two homes there, right? And so those homeowners are gonna to wanna to have a say in what this looks like, and, and, and rightfully so. I know Member Doshi had talked about that process, and so that's all part of the ongoing process that we'll be working through with White and Company, and then also with uh, the Village of Downers Grove. Now this whole area here, not to get too far in the weeds, is also a special drainage area. It's not a floodplain. Um, it is not uh, you know, anything like that. However, we have to be very cognizant of what we're doing. We have to plan for all the water. So likely you would see a retention area under that lot that we could then use for other areas of the property like they have at, at Downer South on 63rd and Dunham with that turf field and then underneath that is water retention. So we like this option. The other thing that we like about this option is this is just for bus parking and event parking. So during the school day, this becomes available to student use for things like physical education. So you don't lose all of this space during the school day. So it's another thing, Tracy, you had asked about ahas. You know, we already have PE teachers saying, well, hey, can we strike this for field events and, and you know, things like pickleball and that so we can utilize it during PE. That was something we certainly weren't necessarily considering when we were doing, but yes, that makes a lot of sense. And so those are some areas I just wanted to make sure that everyone understood that there are some big caveats with this in village approval and going through traffic and parking is still a big piece of this. Great. So moving on to the overall floor plans, this is the existing first floor plan as it sits today. Um, and then this is looking at the conceptual improvements. So anything you see in a dashed uh, red line is actually building addition. Um, and then you see just the organization of classrooms um, and new improvements to the school. So we'll start with um, the main entrance. There will be an addition at the main entrance of Herrick. Herrick will be getting a new front door, if you will. Um, and with that comes all the security features that we talked about at O'Neill, the secured vestibule. Um, but also making sure that the administration staff and student services are all sort of housed in one location at the front of the building, um, but also planning for you know, them to be zoned in their own ways just so they're not interrupting separate functions. Um, we are anticipating the expansion of the kitchen to accommodate sixth grade and um, to expand the food service program. Uh, we're doing some test fits to make sure that we could fit the lunch periods and those students um, who would be now attending lunch in, in, the, in the cafeteria. Another aha moment that we actually heard on the staff night was just um, pointing out the exchange of students that happened at the lunch hour. So we actually widened this corridor um, to really create a two-way traffic just so we could exchange students in and out um, between lunch periods and also just provide more dedicated, deliberate areas for trash collection as they leave the cafeteria um, and keep that sort of in there. Uh, we had a great meeting last week on the FACTS program. Uh, we're starting some schematic layouts of that room and um, starting those conversations moving on. Um, and then same color coding that's happening here. So if a, if a classroom's highlighted, that, that means it's being repurposed, maybe resized, or in many cases in the addition, it's being created because it does not exist. Uh, we're stacking the science um, on two floors, so you'll see three science labs here on the first floor and then three below it. Uh, let's see what else. Um, and then also just planning for um, different exploratory options to meet that program throughout the building. Um, you saw those common spaces at O'Neill, thinking about those same sort of collaboration zones throughout the building just so um, every square foot of the building we're thinking about for, for learning opportunities. 
uh, beyond the four walls of the classroom. So we're now moving down um, to the lower level. This is the existing plan. Uh, and you'll see here the, the classrooms are organized the same way. The library really becomes the heart of the school. Uh, it's in a central location. And we're doing a lot. We heard a lot about the circulation and flow throughout here. A lot of one-way hallways that sort of ended with a dead end. Um, so the hall, the library, and really the hallways around it are a way of just alleviating that traffic. We've also um, actually added a hallway since you last saw those conceptual plans. So there's, we're now closing the loop on both sides of the building just to really help the, the flow around the building. So students could actually navigate to the locker rooms um, going around the existing gym. The new gymnasium here will be um, the storm shelter. That's why you see some of these toilet rooms and some required storage that we need. Uh, let's see, what else? Um, staff toilets was another sort of aha thing we heard when we met with the staff. So anytime we're planning a new student toilet, there's often staff toilets adjacent to it just so staff doesn't have to traverse the entire building to, to use the restrooms. You would talk about the stairs in the library too to get more flow in the building? Uh, yeah, so more flow horizontally, but also more flow vertically too. So right here in the library, we're actually looking at um, a large staircase so that students could quickly get up and down um, without necessarily going all the way to the end of the hallway to get to one of these exit stairs. And the reason that was so important to us, if you're familiar with Herrick right now, a lot of dead ends, really bad traffic flow. We actually have um, the two staircases on the main level, one is up and one is down. And so trying to provide more flow and more options to get vertically uh, was something very important as we were uh, planning this. And so we feel like we've accomplished a lot of that. Of course, you know, when you get down towards those, um, INT stands for intervention or resource classrooms. Um, you know, obviously those are not dead ends because you have stairs at the end of both of those hallways as well. But this will help a lot with the uh, traffic flow, so to speak, inside the building. And then again, we, you're hitting that um, event entrance just like you would have. Herrick is obviously a tricky building because of the slope of the building, but this event entrance is paired to that parking lot that you would have saw out uh, off of Saratoga. So again, at night, this really provides a nice uh, thing for us and then opportunities for rental spaces over the weekend, which we know our community desperately needs. And so with, with this being conceptual, not every door might be shown at this point, but um, we are thinking about ways that um, you know, with, with a set of doors, depending on where it's located, you could really close off the gym, give access to toilet rooms, but really close that off from the rest of the academic spaces in the school. Uh, same way with the cafeteria. Um, we're providing toilet rooms there. There's some existing entries that we're thinking about addressing, um, and maybe you'll see a series of doors here so that the cafeteria can be available after school without giving access to the remainder of the building too. So just thinking about, we call it layering the school, ways we could layer the schools that could be used without disrupting the entire footprint of the building. And that's really where, uh, you know, as Steve talked about it, um, listening to staff. I, I think staff really were, were asking, you know, can you find two ways into the cafeteria just because of the number of students there? Because of the slope of the building, it, it became almost impossible to create another uh, walkway, but doubling that walkway really helps us alleviate that traffic. Also, if you talk to any middle school lunchroom supervisor, I'm a former one, they will tell you that the current setup at Herrick, where the bathrooms are nowhere near the cafeteria, is not necessarily the best recipe for student behavior. Mm -hmm. And so by putting two bathrooms next to the cafeteria, it really does help supervise students it gets rid of kids walking up and down the hallway that really aren't in classrooms, so it's not a disruption to the educational environment. But we certainly have to have continuing conversations about the fax room. Whenever you have something that close to caf uh, cafeteria space where you have multiple lunch rooms walking, or, you know, or, or lunch periods, you know, we'll probably orient that more toward the hallway and less toward that big hallway by the cafeteria, just so it doesn't become a distraction during the uh, learning time. But really, the staff at Herrick and Annual Meal have been great in terms of giving us input, asking us to consider things, and uh, the traffic flow, especially here, was, was really helpful to hear from our staff to make sure that we're, we're getting it right. The other thing that you will see is that all the conference rooms now are in the offices, uh, which is really good. And then we also have additional conference space at both middle schools outside of the conferences, uh, or excuse me, outside of the office space, because we know that we will need uh, some of that conference space as well outside. Um, the difference between Herrick and O'Neill, is there, is it intentional that it's called a collab zone for Herrick but a commons at O'Neill? 
No, those terms are pretty much interchangeably. What we're really trying to get at is widening the hallways, and, and there really isn't any difference between a common area or a collaboration zone. Those are opportunities to widen those hallways, which we know we have to do at Herrick. But also, you know, if you have a group that you want to have some students work out in the hallway, like so for instance, I was at Herrick this afternoon, just about every other classroom had some students working out in the hallway and, and working on group projects and things like that. Just gives you a little bit more room uh, than what we currently have there. So people, so kids could walk by without like stepping over a kid's legs Correct, like I was doing out. today. Yeah, I, I was downstairs happens. across, if you, if you can picture the downstairs. Uh, yeah, you know, I know Literally, I was walking through kids, which yeah. is great. They were working, but it gives you a little bit more space without having to worry about that. And then the other, que the other question I had was, um, I can't tell I'm not an architect, but is the library the same size, smaller, or bigger at Herrick now with this potential drafted model? So if you look at where the two science rooms are up on the left-hand side and you look at the blueprint now, so the current library would be um, smaller than what we're proposing in terms of the, the new library. The new library would be more square footage, and the new library would be a little bit bigger than the one you would see at O'Neill, which makes sense because you're gonna have a third more of the students. Now, when we talk about equity between the library at O'Neill and the library at Herrick, they will both be equitable spaces in terms of what our kids have access to in the new modern field at both of the schools, because that's important. Okay, thank you. And the reason why, it, um, we have to have those science rooms where the old library was is because you get the economy of scale with the gas lines and the water lines and all of that and so that's why we're double stacking those right there versus where you don't have to have that economy of scale by relocating the library to the center part of the building gotcha that's great mm -hmm. intentional two questions um first for the bus drop off versus car drop off mm -hmm. Was there any feedback or comments when you spoke with staff about that in terms of like supervision and how that might be impacted just because you're obviously then going to need supervision in two places as opposed to one for drop off and pick up? Yeah, like and so certainly you're going to have to have supervision in two different spots, which is not necessarily that uncommon, mm -hmm. which you would see. I think at night, though, it also helps when you're only putting it on one side of the building and then you only need supervision on that point. But yes, the other thing we want to make sure everybody understands is that current roundabout and things like that, all that gets revisioned too and so when we're working with the village and all that it, you're going to have that same footprint in terms of parking and traffic but it may look drastically different but we certainly did talk about that one of the things that um, you know Justin is leading up and Jane is leading up are our middle school kind of transition that that committee and so those will be things that we discuss you know do we want to have different entrances for different grade levels where do we want to st start kids off and things like that but certainly um, those will be continuing conversations and then each building will put together a supervision plan with the help of the district office once we get kids there but you would definitely have to have supervision yeah. in both spots of the building here okay and then the other question is when you were talking about O'Neill and one of the great benefits of the way the setup was going to be there was that you'd kind of be able to have that school within a school concept with the upstairs being yeah. for one particular grade level is there any obviously it's very different at Herrick and it's not going to look exactly the same but is there any thought or discussion around being able to make that similar type of thing happen at Herrick as well yeah so those are conversations we're having at both middle schools mm -hmm. how can we fit that school within a school and really um, you know kind of embrace teaming again and get mm -hmm. people into those you know this is more where sixth grade is, this is more where seventh grade is, and this is more where eighth grade is. And for the most part, you're gonna be able to accomplish that. You're gonna break that for things like science and, and library and stuff like that. But yes, those are the two concepts, or the, the same concept that we're exploring at both of our uh, schools. And we feel like in both of these models, you're gonna be able to uh, accomplish that, which we're excited about. The other thing too is, and in, in we deliberately did not put this is where the art room is gonna go. This is where the choir room is gonna go. This is where the rise classroom is gonna go. We're not at that stage yet because all that planning has to take place. And if we started labeling all of these, it would really detract from what we're trying to accomplish. And, and right now, do we have enough space? Are all these things in the right areas? Then we can start labeling where things are gonna go. Question about the cafetorium. Sure. How many rounds of lunch do we currently operate and with the additional sixth grade? Looks like we'll need probably four rounds of lunch and will we be able to accommodate that with the schedules? And It's a and great question. So I know it's hard to see, but if you read that, the capacity says 264. So obviously you'd multiply that by four, a building that will have a little over 900 students. We think we can accomplish this in four periods. 
but we're though planning for a six launch period. So that number will actually be a little bit smaller. But if we went with a four period model, which is our current model, or a six period model, by the way, when I say six period, it really is three periods split in half, or four or two periods split in half. So right now, the way we think we would best accomplish that is through uh, a six period model. You know, again, those, those bigger periods split in half. But that'll be the ongoing work of what our middle school transition team is looking at. But we built it for four at both schools, just in case we went to that model. And when we say four, we're, we mean four comfortably. If you do six periods, that's even more comfortable. And again, we have that ability in, in this model to close out the school, not just for rentals, but also for elections and things like that, where, where we could still host school on some of those days and be able to close out the section of the building. Any other questions on that? Anyone? No. Okay, now we're going to bring up Peter from Bully and Andrews, and he's going to talk about uh, milestones. Or did I go? Did I go? I think just more? a few more. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Maybe you got a little hat. Uh, <laughs> a lot of this we cover. This is just a snapshot of sort of where we're at, what's happening right now, and sort of the next steps from a design standpoint. Um, so we actually have had the uh, building scanned. Um, and that's actually the digital model we're using to do our design, uh, which makes the design process a lot more effective, a lot more accurate. Um, Dr. Russell talked about how he's continuously updating the staff on the improvements. Craig mentioned how we're meeting weekly based on a, a theme or a subject. Last week was facts. This week is going to be about the gyms and locker rooms. We're going to meet about the library. We're going to meet about the art room and the science rooms. Um, those are happening weekly over the next month or so. Um, and then we're trying to wrap up on what we call schematic design. Um, by May. Um, so that includes just further refinement of the plans that you're seeing. Um, we have a better handle on the program, what's going into each space. Um, we'll have a sense of the materials being proposed for the building. You'll get a sense of what the additions will look like at that point. Um, so that would be sort of a May update that we present what we call schematic design. Uh, Dr. Russell talked about the permitting process with the village. Um, that will commence um, in the fall of this year. Um, just going through that process. Amy is well versed with that process with the village. She's done it many times before. Um, and then leading up to um, the bid bidding, um, some early releases of specific trades and specific um, packages um, with construction commencing in the spring of 2024. And that is a perfect segue for Peter to talk about how that would be implemented. Hey everybody, I'm Peter Kuhn with Bullying Andrews. I oversee our education group and uh, really been actively involved with um, everything that has already been shown. So I've been meeting on a weekly basis to, just to make sure that we are always keeping budget, schedule, constructability in mind as the design progresses. Um, but really from an overall schedule standpoint, as we had said, um, right now the additions are planned to start in spring of 2024. So roughly a year from now, once the weather breaks, it would allow us to start putting in foundations, util utility be located, things like that and then we would have three summers of renovations so the summer of 24 summer of 25 wrapping up in the summer of 26 um, so all renovations and addition spaces would be done in the summer of 26 for students to arrive in august of 26. Um, the elementary schools i know we discussed this last meeting when we presented on the project but what we've really done we've assigned four we said four in summer of 24 four in summer of 25 and wrapping up three of 26 now we've really identified what schools we plan to do in each of those summers and what we did is really took the oldest schools first um, so you know Whittier was originally built in um, 1928 so we're taking those schools that really have the most need from a infrastructure improvement life safety improvement things like that we're grouping those and making those a priority to start at 24 those also happen to be really the um, the largest cost drivers from those schools because um, you're putting in the most work of those so we're trying to do those first in order to avoid year-over-year -year escalation um, you know as, as escalation continues to rise just from a labor standpoint and material pricing standpoint um, and then phase two um, four additional schools and phase three um, when we talk about schools that have built, been built the most recently is Bel Air and El Sierra um, those already have HVAC and, um, and cooling in them, so that's why we're really prioritizing those last because they currently have uh, cooling in the most up-to-date infrastructure uh, amongst the district. So it's, it's age, not location? 
Yeah, we're really doing it by age. Um, we were trying to do location, um, but we really prioritize it by age of the building okay. when, when they were originally built. I think one of the things that we want to continue to be very sensitive to with our community is not, you know, give any kind of a hint that one side of town is getting it over the other side of town. And so as we've been really working with our construction management firm, it's what schools are the oldest? And then as, as Peter discussed, what are those more expensive projects that we want to make sure we hit as soon as possible? Because if we don't, you're going to experience the cost escalation, right? And so it's not geography based, it's, it's based on, like, like Stephen pointed out, chronological age and what are the dollar amounts associated uh, with those. Um, so again, geography didn't play a role in that decision uh, making process. Um, but that will certainly be something that we will likely hear from our community. Yeah. And so we do, and I, I appreciate that because I was gonna mention that anyway tonight. We do need to be able to talk about that because everybody does need to understand our, our reasoning and we committed to transparency. We've always been transparent. We wanna make sure that we're doing that as we go forward. And I'll kind of give you just a, a knee-jerk reaction. Sure. Um, mainly from an optics perspective, I would challenge why is Indian Trail last? Yeah, so and, I can. You I know, can yeah, no, I'm just, I'm just giving you just like kind of the, the knee jerk reactions. So, um, why is that in the the last grouping? And then I would, you know, um, just to play devil's advocate, Lester and Paris Downer have already gotten um, recent renovations. So I think those are two reactions that may come out of our yeah. three reactions that may come out of our community. Yeah. So two things I would say. This is the first chance the board has gotten to take a look at this, and so feedback is what we're seeking, right? The second piece is, you know, when you look at buildings like Indian Trail, right? Indian Trail, El Sierra, and O'Neill, in the last renovations that we did in the 90s, they would have got seen significant additions, right? Especially Indian Trail. So a lot of that building is actually newer than some of the other buildings. With Pierce and Lester as well, when you look at those two schools, yes, they did get new additions on one end of the building, you know, basically three classrooms, um, you know, in each. But when you look at the other side of those schools and the need for that, we also want to be careful that we're not allowing those things to just escalate out of control. And so certainly though, um, I had some of the same reaction when you looked at the list because, you know, having been in the community, we know that people are going to say north versus south, you know. Or, and, or Title I is another. Correct, yes, correct. Yeah. And so uh, again, as we continue to fine tune costs, we will continue to make sure that we're following our two guiding principles of chronological age of the building and which projects are going to cost the most as we make the final decisions. Again, we also said as we go through this project, we're going to rely on the construction management firm that we, you know, that they're making the best decisions in terms of cost here, making sure that we can get these things done. Um, one of the things that we are committed to, air conditioning is going to be one of the biggest factors, right, about people who get to go first. Uh, that, that's where I think people are more concerned with which schools are going to be air-conditioned. Um, there's obviously uh, you know, other things to be concerned with. But right now, the number of window units that we have in our facilities, one of the things that we've spent a great deal of time talking about is as some schools come fully online and those window units become available, how can we redeploy those to those schools that haven't had a chance to go yet so we can continue to air-condition as many spaces as possible without overriding the electrical panel in those particular schools. Some of our older buildings are probably not capable of no. very many yeah. of those, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I agree. I think it's important to continue to stress the rationale behind this because everyone is obviously we know, you know, very tied to their neighborhood school, and they everyone's going to want their school to go first, of course, and understandably so. And so, just continuing to make sure we're providing a lot of explanation and um, transparency about the decision making process behind this, I think it's going to be really helpful. You know, communication to parents going to PTA meetings and talking about this, those types of things, just to make sure that we're continually informing and taking feedback from the community. I think it's going to be helpful in getting out in front of them. Yes, exactly. Yeah, the proactive communication is what we've done throughout this process, and we're going to have to keep doing it. And I'm not being naive. I understand talking to school that's scheduled for summer 26 versus talking to one that's scheduled for summer 24, it's going to be a much different conversation, and how do you go about having those uh, conversations? But again, we feel like um, in terms of being objective, that this is the best way to move forward. But I will also caution everybody who's watching this online or maybe here in the audience, 
This is still tentative, this is still a draft, and it's still subject to change as we continue to fine tune the scope of the work and the dollar amounts. That could, that could change. Peter could come back to us and say, hey, we rethought this and here's why. Again, we just have to make sure that we're being transparent with um, the yeah. why behind these and, and I think just to help move that dialogue further, I think a comparison between Hillcrest and Indian Trail would be a, a good to kind of put more detail around that mm -hmm. from a, a cost versus age kind of sure. prioritization. Is, is it fair to say that if I force rank the age of all of our buildings, it would have fallen in this order? Or are there any exceptions where we had to make a different rule because of other costs or construction considerations? And, you know, that becomes challenging because when you talk about when the buildings were built versus the additions that they had, right? And so some buildings, like Indian Trail is a great example, where they had a big addition in the 90s where the original school date might you know, precede some of the ones that might be further ahead on the list. Um, so, but like Hillcrest versus Indian Trail, when you look at the, fil or the footprint of those two schools, Hillcrest is still really, um, a lot of it's in its original form or later construction. In, or, and so those are some examples, but we can certainly in, in the next iteration of this, put when the schools were built with their additions, I think that could be helpful as well. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank thank you. you. That's That's awesome. Mm -hmm. All right. I think we did questions as we went along. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'll put my hand down. <laughs> <laughs> You're being a good example. Yeah. <laughs> okay. That brings us to reports to the board. You're not off the hook yet, <laughs> Kevin. Uh, we pull that up here. Yeah. yeah. No. <laughs> Thank all of you for being here tonight. Thank we you. appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Appreciate Thank it. You. Okay. So I'll try and abbreviate this as best I can. First, I want to start off by thanking uh, the Highland students, staff, and family members for attending this evening. I think Zach Kraft always sets the bar very high. I thought the kids did a great job, and uh, especially with the White Sox and Cubs thing. Uh, but I think <laughs> I we like all know it. Yeah, the, the stickers are all over the district. Zach does a nice job with that. In terms of personnel, I will not give a personnel update today because Dr. Uzentis gave a lengthy uh, personnel report. Um, just wanted to highlight the February 28th Institute Day. I wanted to thank Justin and the entire instructional planning group. Uh, they did a fabulous job with our Institute Day. Um, we have another Institute Day coming up the next election, which will be the Tuesday after uh, spring break. Um, really just a, a great example of differentiation, giving staff choice, but really hitting those uh, critical components that we needed to address in our school district. Also in terms of curriculum instruction, the District Equity Leadership Team, or the DELT, met for the third time this year on March 8th. The team was able to complete the review of the draft equity audit report. As you will recall, we first reviewed the findings in November, but subsequently have reviewed the entirety of the report and been able to have rich discussion around uh, what is included. We've sent our feedback and expect to receive the full report as a PDF in the next week or so. Once uh, received, we'll post it on our website along with the other information we have shared around educational equity. We look forward to continuing the conversation with the board in either late April or May. We also are in the midst of state assessment season. And so our fifth and eighth grade students will be taking the uh, Illinois Science Assessment prior to spring break. And our students in third through eighth grade will take the Illinois Assessment, or assessment of Readiness, which is IAR, after spring break. So our teachers are spending a lot of time uh, ensuring that they're familiar with the assessment and the students are familiar with the assessments in preparation because this is an online test and we want to make sure that our students are available. Um, Justin and the building principals have been doing a nice job working through all of that. Uh, as previously shared, the district in terms of finance will be amending its budget later in the spring. Uh, school districts often amend their budgets when you have significant changes in revenue or expenditures or both during a school year. As you're aware, we just passed a huge referendum and sold bonds, so we do have to amend our budget and we will be doing that later this spring. Uh, in addition to just amending it for uh, the bond sale, we'll also take this opportunity to make other necessary adjustments. One example of this is the potential prepayment for a future lease space with the village that is scheduled to start in 2024. I hope everybody noticed uh, the progress they're making on the building. The board may recall that in the approved 23 budget, there's an earmark for potential uh, payment of $500,000 to the village if it would help reduce the borrowing costs of the construction of the new civic center. 
The goal of the transfer was to reduce the borrowing cost for the community. After recent conversations with the village regarding the payment, it was determined that there was no advantage or lowering of borrowing costs for the village to receive the early payment. Therefore, the district will instead keep the funds and uh, transfer them into the operating or from the operating into our capital and will uh, be noted in the amended uh, budget. So we will just pay as scheduled uh, according to the original agreement uh, because there's no advantage at this time to prepayment. In terms of technology, um, registration began today. So I want to thank uh, James Eichmiller, Faith Bear, Megan Hewitt, who's on leave, and then also Snally Paddle for all the work they've been doing along with our building principals. Uh, but that did open up today, and that really underscores the importance of trying to determine our staffing. We've been trying to hit a goal where we can open this up in March prior to spring break, and we hit that, and so we're excited about that. Um, also, we're excited after spring break, we'll begin our Raptor visitor screening system. Some of the schools have it up and going in a pilot already, and um, there's been a lot of communication. I know all the board members are parents up here, so I know you've been receiving a lot of the information on that. In terms of student services, uh, families of students eligible for extended school year should have received a regist uh, registration link um, from their case manager. If they didn't or have questions regarding their child's eligibility for extended school year services, please contact your child's support team who can assist you with the next steps. This summer, extended school year ESY will again be hosted at Indian Trail from 8.15 to 11.15 from June 13th to July 13th. Obviously, there's no school on June 19th, June 3rd, and July, or excuse me, July 3rd and July 4th, in observance of the federal holidays. In terms of facilities, the district is also taking several steps to enhance our safety protocols and procedures in addition to the referendum work. As we previously shared, we're in the process of implementing our new Raptor system. We're also working with the ROE on tabletop exercises for threat assessments. Our threat assessment team met this morning with the ROE and we went through exercises, which was very beneficial. Um, we're also partnering with the ROE to assess our facilities, both during the school day and at night, um, where they're gonna come and give us suggestions for improvement. So we're looking forward to that. You know, as we talked about the referendum, it was more than just physical additions to our buildings. What else are we doing and the district will continue to deploy in all of the above approach when it comes to security not just secured entrances but Raptor system working with the ROE fine-tuning our threat assessment protocols and procedures so we can continue to get better and better in this area in terms of public relations, the Ed Education Foundation of District 58 is really ramping up. This is their busy season. So we close the applications for Select 58, which honors eighth graders uh, for their service to school and community. We look forward to honoring the 58 eighth graders who are selected at O'Neill on May 3rd. In addition, the foundation has launched its annual Distinguished Service Award application that honors exceptional staff. Applications are due March 22nd, and we encourage you to nominate a staff member if you think they deserve that award. And then finally, at next uh, month's board meeting, I will be asking the board to approve an intergovernmental agreement with all of the other school districts in DuPage County that's led by the ROE. The Regional Superintendent of Schools, Dr. Darlene Ruschetti, the DuPage County State's Attorney, Bob Berlin, and the school districts in the county have been working jointly on an intergovernmental agreement so we can all coordinate with one another in the event of an emergency, whether that's severe weather, an unexpected school closure, heaven forbid a tragedy, or something of that nature. This IGA simply commits school districts to sending support on a voluntary basis in the event there's a major need. The nice thing about the agreement is that DuPage County will oversee the coordination uh, and support of this through a centralized app. So if we did have an emergency in the district and we needed help from other districts, DuPage County would help organize that for us versus myself or my team having to organize that. On the flip side, if there was an incident in a different district, we could send support, whether that's social workers, whether that's B&G staff, whether that's administrators. Um, and so the, the cost of this software program is about $400 annually. I, I think it's money well spent and all the other school districts, we just had a meeting in terms of this um, for superintendents last week. There seemed to be broad support for this and most people are going to the board in April or May and asking for approval of this IGA. Dr. Ruschetti is recommending it, and so is the state's attorney, Bob Berlin, and I think this is a really good thing for all the uh, school districts in DuPage County. I hope this is something we never have to use, but it's great to be prepared. And again, it's on a voluntary basis, so if you weren't able to send support, you're not obligated to send the support. That concludes the superintendent's report. Any questions? Thank you. Anyone? Great. Appreciate it.
All right, next up, Todd Dreyfall with the monthly business and treasurer's report. I'll take a moment to tell everyone it's good to get up and stretch once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, if, if you're like me, uh, your personal emails have probably had four or five emails or a couple emails from your banks today on how they are managing collateralization and so forth. We've had a few. Um, just to kind of quickly cover uh, another part of your month to date report and your investment report. In the treasurer's report, you will have, as we do every month, uh, a list of the investments and in where the district has and, and, and where they're at. Um, a good majority of the operating funds are invested in treasuries um, that when they are in an investment format. For those that are cash on hand at Fifth Third, which is a, a regional very large bank, um, we have a third party collateralization report with Bank of New York uh, that is an automated system that continually collateralizes and ensures that our funds are safe. So that is one of the things uh, we wanted to point out just as we went through all of that given uh, the weekend's news uh, and everything as to you know, the fact that you know, the district does manage that and, and it is checked with the audit. The, audit. the auditors do review those things on an annual basis, um, but that we are continually watching it. And you see a report every month on those things. Um, so that's one area part we don't normally talk about, but wanted to make sure we point out uh, is in the report uh, this evening. Outside of that year-to-date report, we're into our coming into our low cash point where we're waiting for uh, the early tax receipts to come in uh, for year-end. So you'll see um, expenses will start to continually exceed revenues uh, for the next couple months. Um, and in that transfer that the board approved last month of $10 million uh, from working cash into the Ed Fund, uh, that's our internal bank, uh, so that we have those funds available to us um, and that transfer is in, it listed in the year-to-date report. Other than that, um, you have on your agenda tonight, uh, this summer's uh, capital work or the remaining bids uh, and work to be approved by the board uh, for playgrounds, asbestos abatement, uh, floor replacement uh, at Puffer um, uh, for, for this summer's work. Um, you also have two contracts uh, for our, con our uh, transportation firms. Uh, we're happy that um, given that some of the conversations of other districts and what they were seeing in renewals, uh, that um, our renewals were around six and six and a half percent. Uh, and we're very happy and continuing to work with um, our, our partners in transportation. And I will take this moment to also uh, do an advertisement that if you know of anyone looking and wanting for work to drive a bus, uh, they are more than happy and willing to take applicants at any given time. And if, with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you. Any questions or comments? Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. All right. The policy committee has not met since the last board meeting, but the legislative committee did meet on March the 10th, 2023. Um, Member Hannes? Um, pretty uneventful at that meeting. Essentially, we just kind of... Um, reviewed and talked about the legislative breakfast and the feedback that we received from surveys that came in from that. Um, overall, the feedback was, was really, really positive. Um, everyone seemed to kind of enjoy the format of the mixed um, large group versus small group. And, you know, some suggestions here and there on and improvements. We kind of talked about things we might tweak for, for the years coming forward. But overall, it was really great feedback from those who attended and, and filled out the surveys. And uh, we just kind of, you know, walked through that a little bit and, and talked a little bit about what we might try to, you know, tweak for years to come. But it was, you know, short and sweet. Fantastic. Questions, comments? All right. That brings us to the Financial Advisory Committee, which also met on March the 10th, 2023. Uh, so some of that discussion was around our year-to-date report and the summer work, which we just went over, as well as the transportation contracts. We talked a little bit about uh, the fact that those are extensions and that uh, while we don't like to see 65 and 6% increases, there it, it's certainly um, uh, a lot healthier than, than what it could have been. Uh, we did spend a decent amount of time talking about a capital policy. So the FAC, I, I think everyone... Uh, is aware that we've been working on a new policy to put money into a capital fund annually. Uh, we are sort of coalescing around a policy where we maybe have a goal somewhere around a million dollars a year, but have a, a minimum of 
of three quarters of a million, seven hundred fifty thousand dollars that would go into there at least for this initial phase while we're in our the construction piece of it there's a, a lot that goes into this and making sure that we can properly um, budget around this and make sure that we can we can hit the numbers so uh, we will have something for you in, you know uh, this school year to uh, ratify but that we would like to get that that moving um, we also talked a little bit about food service they're continuing to make progress on that as you know the the law changed around uh, hiring a new lunch service, but it is brand new. So th they're working through that and putting the final pieces. They're, they're working towards getting to the point of an RFP. There is a desire to not only bring hot lunch to our middle schools, but also down to all the elementary schools. Now that would not be able to be ready for the fall. Or I'm, yeah, for the fall, but we would like to see that for next school year. So uh, they're, they're trying to, to work out all those pieces. That does involve getting some equipment into each of the elementary schools and, and so we talked about making sure that obviously that equipment is also the equipment that would make sense once additions are done kids are out and and that we're not doing some work and then i'm doing the work and they felt pretty confident uh in that front so uh, that concludes my report unless steve has additional just uh one note of commentary when we we're talking about the, the capital budgeting piece and, and targeting a dollar amount, uh, you know, around a million dollars, seven hundred fifty thousand to a million. One of the things that I kind of uh, requested, some related to the staffing, is you know we always kind of talk talk about topics for a long period of time or a short period of time, like um, all day kindergarten was an eight hundred thousand um, dollar price point. So I, I think it's good when we start talking these conversations about. Um, staffing or whatever we can kind of bring up a, a dollar amount you know we talk about ipads or whatever that we kind of have the big picture in mind instead of kind of getting lost in the details or, or kind of bundled it all together so that was one thing that we kind of talked about is how do we um keep big picture in mind instead of kind of getting caught in the weeds on, on some of these topics so that's that's something else that we talked about there but Excellent summary as, as always, there. Thank you. Can I, yeah. I just want to throw in, uh, my two cents in, in terms of your, your, as I understand it, you're talking about creating a policy for, um, that would requ require the, compel the district to set a certain amount of dollars aside right. each year for capital projects. Um, my two cents would be to put in um, language in that policy that says that that 750 or that 1 million grows by CPI every year so that we don't revisit that. Um, Five years, ten years down the road, and say, "Oh gosh, we've been kind of we haven't been keeping up." Just, just make sure it just, it just kind of automatically grows over time, so we don't have to um, amend the policy to to meet uh, increasing needs. That is a great suggestion. In fact, it's it was it is part of their topic of conversation. The initial thought was to just do something along those lines. Then, as we looked at it, while we're in our construction period for the referendum keeping that at a flat dollar amount mm -hmm. and getting that base in there and then doing an analysis of how our finances work coming out of the referendum and looking at our dollar amount and then setting that as a starting point. So part of the policy that they're looking at writing is having a time frame where we set and review and we sort of set that next um, that next component into there, but which would probably be a four or a five year uh, time frame of setting that. So having it fixed with like a base and a, a goal and, and a minimum in the in these first couple of years getting a foundation for it but then yes absolutely um, you know because one of the things we were talking about is is how do the how do the how does the capital fund work and, and what is its goals and and is this something that we build for 20 years and then we use it for a big project and, and we really had them the discussion around it no like we're looking at being able to fix roofs as they come out without having to immediately go out to kind of issue non-referendum bonds and so by looking, the CPI thing is very important because uh, the, when you look at a cost of a roof and we have 13 buildings and the rotation that we may have to be in to, to fix them, that every couple of years we've got to be prepared to, to fix one of those and, and how do you make sure that you've got funding for it and that can, in 10 years' time, right. now you're, you're not sufficient anymore. Thanks. No, thank you for the recommendation. Anything else? Okay. The district leadership team met on February the 27th. Member Doshi? Yeah, I'll do a. Um, there were two big topics that we discussed. Both of them are being covered here tonight. Uh, one is the strategic planning recommendation, and the other is uh, the footprint updates and designs. And so 
I won't touch on those because uh, either we've heard about it or we will soon. Uh, there are a couple of other updates that are quicker that I'll, I'll share. Um, at district leadership team, we always hear about each of our strategic plans, current goals, so goals one, two, and three. Um, on goal one, uh, Justin shared about uh, the work that's being done around parental education, uh, opportunities for parents to be able to understand what's happening in classrooms, uh, the scope and sequence of curriculum, and uh, the, the work that's being done with the, by the Curriculum Council is really to find ways to leverage existing assets, i.e. our websites, to be able to have parents be able to use those as a resource uh, to identify if you're in fourth grade and you're struggling in uh, helping your student with math, what's the scope and sequence, what are the units, what are the resources that are available to me as a fourth grade parent? Uh, and if I'm a parent of a first grader, same thing, but I can go to the same place on the website to be able to access those resources. And so uh, that's the current uh, work that the Curriculum Council is doing. Uh, um, so that's a summary a bit of, about the work that's happening currently on goal one. Uh, goal two, uh, we talked about the facility vision visioning sessions. Uh, Dr. Russell gave some updates here there today. Um, and then for goal three, uh, we talked uh, about some of the uh, costs associated with our, our work uh, and how those bonds are being issued. And so uh, not a lot of updates there that we haven't heard. Um, so those are the quick DLT updates. Uh, Darren, you were there. Anything else that you would add? No, I, 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 great job, and like you said, we have a, a lot on the agenda tonight that really does overlap directly with that meeting. So, and thank you for having me um, to that meeting. Any other questions or comments? All right, the Health and Wellness Committee met on March the 2nd. Uh, Vice President Hearns? Yep, um, during that meeting, we spent a lot of time at, uh, talking about our wellness incentives, and uh, this is, uh, we're a few, two or three years into into this program with the idea of if we if we figure out how to help to get our staff to live more healthy lives, that's going to save our plan money because, um, for example, um, helping our staff staff maintain healthy weights now um, is cheaper than um, treating diabetes 10, 20 years from now. So um, our idea is always to encourage more staff to, um, to participate through certain incentives. Um, we want to, obviously, the more participation, the better, and we just need to figure out how to pull the right levers to maximize participation. And we looked at a the very limited amount of historical data and, and trying to find um, opportunities to improve that. Um, we, uh, only had, we met at the beginning of March, but we only had uh, January data related to our health plan. Um, our, unlike uh, everything else, our, our health plan doesn't, we don't look at it um, it's not, it doesn't follow the fiscal year, it follows the calendar year, so we, we reset premiums January 1, and we start looking at um, how our plan's performing at the beginning of the calendar year as opposed to July 1st with everything else. Um, so we don't have a ton of data to, to predict um, how we're going to be um, looking six months or nine months from now when we're, nine months from now when we're resetting um, premiums, but um, so far, so good. Um, we are projected to have a surplus, but it's still obviously very early. Thank you. All right, any comments or questions? Great. All right, that brings us on to the discussion section. We have two items up today. The first one is a strategic planning update. You're back up. Yeah, so I want to welcome Dr. Uh, Bob Madonia, who's going to come and uh, talk to us about strategic planning. Uh, Dr. Madonia will go over his process, and it is the recommendation of uh, the administration uh, that we engage with Dr. Madonia for strategic planning. So this is a chance, uh, just like he did with the DLT, to provide an overview of the process and also to answer any questions uh, that the board may have. I think James is getting uh, everything back up here. Uh, and um, you know, please feel free once uh, Bob is done, if you have any questions of Bob or myself uh, throughout the process, uh, please let us know. Also, there's a pretty detailed memo in board docs tonight for the community uh, that gives the rationale and kind of the overview of what we're thinking. So with thank that, uh, welcome Dr. Madonia. Well, thank you very much. And uh, special thanks to the board and to Dr. Russell for the opportunity to be here tonight to explain to you our strategic planning process. Uh, strategic planning is, is a phenomenal, process that and I'm, this process has worked very well in all size districts um, we just I just completed a plan in Plainfield 202 we have 30 schools 28,000 students just completed a plan in Wakanda 118 which is a more medium-sized district and then a smaller district in Libertyville 70 up in Lake County so but I have to say to you that it is just a phenomenal process and one that is extremely collaborative and engaging. Um, and I think you'll find it to be quite beneficial. Um, 
the PowerPoint that's up on the screen would kind of go over a little bit about the, uh, let's see, is that going? there it goes. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the process and then open it up to any questions that you might have. Um, but the first step in our process is basically to meet as a board and administrative team and talk about and establish the focus areas of study, which are the foundation of our planning. Um, and I think, you know, you've done a phenomenal job with your previous plan, and I think there are many things that we're going to continue to grow on out of that plan, and so there'll probably be some things that will surface that will be a focus area, but then again, in our discussions at that meeting, there will be many things that might surface that also are important for the next five years of planning. So I think um, that's, that's the first step in our process. And once we have the focus areas established, then what we do next is to, let's go over here, there we go, is I will put together a survey for the, the district for, to solicit stakeholder feedback on the focus areas of study. It's, as you know, this is a very collaborative process. We're very happy to be on record to solicit everyone in the district, whether you're on our planning committees or whether you are just a constituent who is part of our district team and we want your input into this process. So we'll be very, we're gonna put that out there. We'll develop that. We'll put it on the web for people to fill out. We'll also provide other f venues of the survey in the event that uh, there is someone who is not comfortable using the internet. There, there'll be many options. And what we will do is then collect the data from that survey and we'll put it together into a summarization form for our strategic long range planning committee to look at and consider when they do the big planning that we do uh, during this process. What we also highlight though is that the data received is one piece of data because we're going to get a lot more data when we meet with our community committee or, uh, also. So we make that very clear. The third step in our process is to assemble our strategic long range planning committee. And this is a very diverse group. Um, and it, it, it goes over two days. There's a total of seven hours of work, three and a half hours each day. Uh, we're very good about being on task and on time. We never go over. Um, I, I'm proud of that because the people who are serving on our committee are volunteers and we want to respect their time and their commitment and their contributions to this process. But I think what's beautiful about our strategic long range planning committee is that it's diverse and it's reflective of the constituent base of the, of the district. You know, from municipal officials to someone maybe from the fire department, District 99, the police department, you know, they're all different broad-based constituent groups. And I was very excited to meet with the DLT to talk to them about this process and a question that came up about students. And certainly we uh, are happy to have students involved and get feedback from them in this process as well. Um, so once we get the committee put together, um, and what I always recommend to districts is that we invite people, particularly those that are leaders in the community or parent leaders in your uh, various PTAs, PTOs, and so forth, their organizations. Uh, but we also open it up for volunteers and asking what their backgrounds are and try to match some of their backgrounds and expertise with our focus areas of study, which makes, makes sense. And so what we do then when we have the committee put together is we actually assign people to focus area subgroups. And we do that for a reason, to maximize their expertise. But also, human nature being what it is, when you walk into a room of let's say 100 people, people will have a tendency to gravitate to a table where it, they know people. And that's not necessarily the best for planning. Um, the fourth step is one I'm really excited about because that's what's unique about our process. Our process is just as much a public relations endeavor as it is a planning tool. 
the connections that the board and the administration will make with their community will be like, like a phenomenal experience. And so I'm very excited about that. That's the thing that districts are really thrilled about when they go through this process. So what we like to do is that each of our focus area tables have minimum of a board and an administrator at each table. And what we try to do is we have two roles at that table. One is being the spokesperson for the group and the other is to be the data keeper. And so um, this is an opportunity to directly connect with your stakeholders. I mean, they will view you and see you in a light they probably haven't had a chance to interact with you before on a personal level. And there's much to be said for that. Um, we will provide an opportunity to meet with the board administrators to train them and give them some feedback about what their roles will be like. Uh, we'll also go through a very br brief role play session uh, so that they know exactly what it's like as they go through the process. So when they leave that training session, they'll feel 100% comfortable going into our two days of planning. So what I'd like to do is talk to you a little bit about the committee process. And um, the results of our survey, as I referenced earlier, is going to be on each table. And the committee is divided up into the focus groups. And the first charge of each group will be to identify a five item prioritized list of what's important for the district for the next five years. And this will elicit a lot of conversation around the table and <coughs> what will happen during that time period. And myself and Dr. Russell will be floating from table to table to be actively engaged and involved with this. But it'll have the opportunity for them to give their input into that and to categorize that and to come up with five items prioritized list one through five, one being the most important, five being the least. And to actually then the spokesperson for that group will stand up in front of the entire strategic planning group and will explain their five item prioritized list. In the meantime, the data keeper is going to type that into a Google Docs document, uh, which will then have all five or six focus area groups, five item prioritized list in one document. And we also typically have easels next to each table where you can see a visual of the five items. Um, that usually ends day one and then we go into day two and day two is an exciting time. What happens on day two is each person gets a sheet highlighting the five item prioritized lists of all focus area groups. And what they do is from their vantage point, they look at the other four or five focus areas, not theirs, but the other groups, and have a discussion and decide whether they agree with that prioritization or not. You know, they may, for example, a finance group, I'm using it as an example, may have one, two, three, four, five, and another focus group may look at that and say, oh, I think it's three, four, five, one, two. And so what I will do in this massive facilitation that we're going to have once that piece is complete, and that's usually about an hour endeavor, is we'll do a complete facilitation of the entire group. And so we'll have one group go up to the other group, put up how they viewed their list, tell them why, and then I'll say to them, okay, how do you respond to that finance group? I'm using it as an example. And they'll, they'll either explain and clarify why, or they'll say, hey, gee, that's a great idea that never even came up in our conversation. And you see things start to refine itself, and um, it, it really is a beautiful thing to see. So um, once that's complete, then we, um, we then have each focus area group has a color. And so what we do then, once everybody has given their input into everyone else's focus area, uh, then what we do is we do a final evaluation. And so what we, and this is a piece that committee members love. Uh, and what they do is each group has a color, and so each group, let's say there are, are five focus areas, each group gets 10 self-adhesive colored dots, two of each color. 
And so we tell them, okay, now let's just, after they establish the final order, and remember, in establishing the final order, it's data, because everybody has already listed how they viewed the order. So it's directly connected to data. And so they'll walk around the room and put their number one and number two personally at how they feel. And they love doing that. And 95% of the time, it coordinates with the final evaluation of the order of each group uh, because we just had this massive facilitation discussion for over an hour explaining it so but um, if there's two that are close then sometimes we merge those together into one priority but the top two then in each of the focus areas are the goals and so and the remaining three priorities will become goals when we complete the top two. Because it's important to do the most in your top two goals than it is to do something in all of them. Because you'll do very little in all of them rather than a lot in your top priorities. So, so what will happen then um, is I will then draft, uh, spend some time drafting the verbiage because it'll come in as raw verbiage and so we'll do that. Um, and then what will happen after that is we will take, and I'm sure you saw the calendar that's being proposed, we'll take some time then to, to actually have the administrators craft action plans to address those goals, and that's very appropriate because they're the ones that have to deliver on, this prog on the progress. So they'll craft that. Um, we kind of scheduled that throughout the summer, which I think is a great opportunity and a time to do that where we can craft action plans to address our goals. Um, and then also what we will do with, during that time frame as per the calendar is we'll take the data we've received and we'll look at our mission, vision, and core values. And we either develop them, refine them, or leave them as is to make sure it's appropriate and fits the needs of the district. So we'll do that as well. And then what will happen is I will put together a brochure for the district. Um, and that is a very nice capsule version of all of our work. It's great for public relations. It's great for on your website for your public to view. And I think, um, but I think what you've, I wish you could be a fly on the wall to see the committee members at the end of the two days. They're so excited, without exception in all the plans I've done, and I've done over 75 of them, um, without exception, they are ambassadors of goodwill for the district. They're so excited about what they've done, and the enthusiasm is amazing. And so the other piece, though, that I want to just share with you, and then I'll open it up to any questions you might have, is our, our planning process is active and alive. And that's one of the things that other strategic planning process sometimes hit snacks. You know, you develop this five-year plan and then it sits on a shelf and it's not active. We don't have that. We have benchmarks for outcomes every 12 months. So what we always recommend is that we meet every 12 months with the committee, report out our progress, and give them a sneak preview on what's going to come the next 12 months. Um, I'm very excited that our process promotes the culture of continuous improvement in school districts. And I know you aspire to that. And I think this just dovetails with that culture. So let me open it up to any questions that you might have. Any current questions? I do want to echo, um, I, I've had the opportunity in my previous superintendency to uh, do a strategic plan with Dr. Madonia, and at the end of that second day, you, you do see that excitement. One thing I, I do want to talk about, um, it just provides some background, because we did have an extensive conversation at DLT about timing, and does it make sense to wait until the fall to do this work, or does it make sense to go ahead and move forward right now? And we really um, hemmed and hawed and, and you know, took that feedback and had some really good conversations with our administrative team. 
When it really boiled down to it, I, I think some things really pushed us to the spring. As Dr. Madonia suggested, that summer time frame to really work on this as a district office and an administrative team on uh, the action planning and, and defining those action plans really um, you know, gravitated us toward the spring date. We also thought that even though the final plan would not be you know, all hashed out until the October curriculum workshop when we would present you know, everything in its final form, to have those key areas of study done, to start the school year off with that, to be able to share with the staff the direction that we're going, being able to start the school year off with that was also very important. And then finally, as we just demonstrated in the um, you know, previous presentation with the construction schedule and things that we have, while no time is ideal in education uh, right now because there's just so many things going on, we really felt like the fall would be even busier than the spring. But some things that we certainly have to be conscious of is um, community engagement when you're talking in April and May. Um, sometimes that you know fades at the end of the school year. So we really have to double down on that uh, recruitment effort and inviting people in and making sure that we get a great representation of stakeholders. So we really appreciated the DLT feedback and the um, kind of direction the DLT gave us was really think about this, come back and then give us your recommendation. And, and so that is certainly what we did. And I want to thank our assistant superintendent team for you know really having that good quality conversation around this. Kevin, um, I, I know we talked about this and you actually said there was a lot of excitement on that. Uh, a couple of things I just want to note real quick. One is uh, for those of you that didn't go through the last strategic planning process, there is a lot of parallels here that are, are similar uh, to what we did last time. and. Um, some of the modeling and stuff that they were talking about with the, the color coding and stuff was also very similar to the work that we did during the referendum process mm -hmm. with the Citizens Task Force, is that what we mm -hmm. called it? Yeah. Yep. Um, so, uh, you know, so that's a process I think that in general we as a, a community are, are in general comfortable with. I, I have one question that I, I don't think came up in the DLT meeting um, and that is five years ago when we went through our strategic planning process we really sort of turned everything on its ear, right? We really wanted a, a full re a reboot uh, to sort of build a, a foundation here for our district of growth. And if you've seen our previous strategic plan, it was very aggressive and we did a lot of work, uh, including rolling out brand new curriculum in every area um, and obviously getting to a referendum. But when, when we kind of designed that, we sort of designed that to be pillars to build on in the next phase. Have you in the past done that where you've come in and sort of um, said, all right, they've been working on, and that sort of helped us build a foundation, and now we sort of want to build a house on top of that? Uh, is that, have you worked with districts that are sort of in this board where I, where I almost feel like we're in half time as opposed sure. to like in that full Re, you know, reboot phase. Sure. No, that's a, that's an excellent question, and act, actually, I have. And in any district where they have done a different plan prior, we have taken what has come out of that plan that has been formidable and that you want to build upon, and formulated that into our plan to go a step further and to continuously improve and enhance in those areas. So the answer to the question is yes. And what I will also say, uh, there are a number of districts where I've done more than one plan, and we do the same thing even with the plan that I've done prior. Like now in Libertyville, I just, I just completed the third plan for them since 2011, and we have done that in every one of those plans because things that come out of that are really things we want to continue to enhance and build upon. And so I think your point's very well taken. And I think that should be an inherent part of every strategic plan that's done. Perfect. And this is an upcoming agenda item on tonight's uh, meeting. So it, you know this, this is a great opportunity if there's any questions or comments either across the table here or for our guest here tonight. We really appreciate you being out here tonight, and thank you for the presentation. It's my pleasure, and it's great to meet all of you, too. You as well. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. thank you very much. Uh, we have uh, one last item up for discussion tonight, and that is the SASIC government structure and update on the joint articles of agreement that are going to be coming up in next month's meeting. So.
Okay, good evening. Hi, Jessica. Hi, Glenn. <laughs> Two times. Yeah, so twice. Uh, so we're going to start off today with uh, talking about a proposed change to Sassan's government structure. Unlike strategic planning, we're not asking for a vote tonight. Uh, the intention here is just to really have a public conversation about some of the changes that Sassan is proposing. And Jessica and I wanted to walk those uh, through with you. In addition to some of these structural changes to governance, SASA is also currently going through a robust strategic planning process where Todd is participating from a financial end, I'm participating, and Jessica is obviously participating from a special education lens as well. And so tonight what we want to do is talk to you about what, this, what these changes are, what our recommendation is, and then certainly field any questions uh, because we would imagine that the board would like to see uh, further information about some of these changes because it is a change in um, structure to uh, what SASA is uh, currently doing. And I, I just wanted to start by kind of overviewing that special education cooperatives really exist for the purpose of providing specialized and cost-effective services uh, to member districts and, and most importantly to member district families and children. And we certainly have benefited from a very uh, long and strong and uh, productive relationship with SASSET over the years. So, I mean, amazingly to me, they've been around since the 1950s, which when you think about special education law, like that didn't even really come into play until the 70s and its current structure of having 18 member districts um, being a part of their their joint agreement um, has really been in place since the 1990s and at this point um, all of District 99 feeder schools participate um, in the cooperative as well as District 99. So we are definitely in good company uh, in this in this organization. And then you know, like all educational organizations, they 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 are in transition, um, really looking at ways that they can continue to evolve to meet the changing needs of the face of students with uh, unique special education needs. So the transit the um, strategic planning process has really been uh, a very engaging process. I'm excited about the things that they're coming forward with, um, really looking at improving services, improving transparency, supporting families, and obviously that financial st uh, st stability and sustainability component as well. So, but I'm gonna let uh, Kevin talk a little bit about, about those organizational structures. So in terms of how SASSET is currently structured, they have two boards. One is called the Board of Control. And that's comprised of one representative from each member district, and it either is a local board member or a superintendent. Um, district 58 is not represented by the superintendent. We're represented by one of our board members. Um, member Hannes is our current representative. Prior to that, it was member Harrison. Prior to that, it would have been a member Purcell, I believe, uh, was there. Um, and they oversee right now the board of control, the day-to-day -day operations, and not um, uh, you know, a really different way than what the current administration will be doing here in District 58. The other board is a governing board. It meets less frequently. That's also comprised of representatives from member districts, including, uh, you know, local board members uh, also make up this board. District 58 is also represented by uh, Member Hannes on that board. So some districts are represented by their superintendent. Others are represented by a uh, board member. Historically, 58 has always been represented by a board member, um, where if you look at Marker right next door, they're represented by their superintendent. And so we've just kind of continued this status quo over time. And then obviously the governing board oversees the governance. So in a nutshell, uh, beginning May 1st of this year, member district superintendents will assume representation on the board of directors uh, if, we, if this um, proposed amendment passes. Um, because SASA does have some really amazing and long standing, standing uh, serving school board members um, on their committees at this point, um, there is transition plan language that allows the board to decide if current members uh, can, will remain on their board if they prefer that for a specific amount of time. Um, however, after May 1st, uh, districts cannot designate new Board of Education members to the Board of Directors position. And so in terms of a response, just to kind of walk you through what, what's been taking place at SASA and what they're asking their member districts to do. So on February 22nd, uh, the Board of Control adopted a resolution uh, that sponsored the amendment. It was unanimous. Um, had had to be ratified by, uh, now it has to be ratified by two-thirds of the member districts. The way the joint article of agreements are written 
if the board doesn't take any action, it's a passive agreement. So we are asking our board, whether or not you're in favor of this or whether or not you're against it, to you know have the opportunity to vote. Because if you didn't, it would be a passive yes. Uh, we did not write those articles of, of uh, agreement, but that is how it's set up. And so certainly we wanted to make sure that our board has the opportunity to have their voice heard after we present this with you uh, this evening, and then we would vote on it in um, April. We have 60 days to get this done, and that's why um, we would still have an opportunity in April. So uh, we are recommending uh, that that you consider approving the recommended changes at the upcoming meeting. Um, we like the idea that District 58 will continue to be represented on both of the SACID boards. Um, we recognize that it's a very comparable structure to how school districts are currently organized. So um, on the new, under the new SACID uh, administrative structure, the superintendents would oversee operations and board members would oversee governance. Um, and it really uh, would continue to support that continuous improvement uh, that they're currently going through, that we're currently going through, that we really believe is in the best interest of our, our students and families. Right, so we'll, we don't have a question one on there, but uh, you know, obviously we want to make sure that you have questions. And, and I want to just um, you know, also give, as the superintendent, why I would be recommending uh, these changes. Um, I think SASID has really, over the last several years, um, taken a long, hard look in the mirror and you know, said, how can we get better as an organization? So I commend them first and foremost for going through the strategic planning process. One of the things that I felt as a superintendent is almost a disconnect because I happen to work for a member district uh, that is not necessarily represented by the superintendent, it's represented uh, by a board member. So oftentimes it's kind of the reverse of what we would see happening here at our district. I have to go to member Harris or I would go to uh, you know, uh, member Hannes and say, you know, please talk to me about what's going on there. It doesn't mean that we're disconnected, uh, but my experience in special education cooperatives is actually what is being proposed. So when I was the superintendent in South Cook with the Eisenhower Cooperative, uh, the board of directors was um, comprised of all superintendents. Uh, they had a little bit of a different structure. My home district was actually the, the agency, and so we oversaw you know, the finances and things like that. Um, what this would allow um, us to do as, as superintendents is we would be more involved in those day-to-day -day operations, the things that we've got a lot of expertise in, what we wouldn't be involved in, though, in terms of being able to have the final say, are some of those bigger governance structures like policy or hiring or retaining the executive director. Um, those bigger things like the budget would still be at that governance um, level. And you know, there are certainly pros and cons to any structure. I know I've had conversations with members on our board about this and, and discuss some of those pros and cons. So certainly, we're not looking for a vote tonight, but if you were to ask us what our recommendation would be, both as the Assistant Superintendent of Special Education and the Superintendent, we would recommend um, adopting these changes. Now, one of the things that we'd also recommend, no matter what the structure is, is that given how big our district is and how much interaction we have with SASIT, is that we continue to work very closely so that our dollars are being spent wisely in SASIT, so that financial oversight, but more importantly as well is making sure that our students are getting the best services uh, that they're entitled to and that we need to make sure that we provide when our students are over at the cooperative. And I think, you know, I, I use this phrase a lot, and people can disagree on what's the best structure, right? Is the best structure where you have a combination of board members and superintendents at that board of directors level? or you know, is the, the best combination what we have here, regardless of I think we all have the same goals, which is making sure our kids get the best services in the most financially responsible manner. Um, this would allow though, me as the superintendent and my fellow superintendents across the 18 districts to really be more involved in the day-to-day -day operations, um, which I think um, can be very helpful and allow the board to still keep their traditional role of that oversight and governance. So Kevin, mm -hmm. you know, if we were to support this, and and I understand that the likelihood of it passing when a, a, it's passively yes, right, is, is high, you know. But my, my question in our support, and even if either way, when this comes to fruition, um, 
when there's a disconnect between the governance board and this board of control, um, I, you know, I think about the action that we take here, and one of the reasons why we can be so effective is because we are very engaged in what's going on in the district. What are steps that we can take in the district to be better informed on what's going on at SASID so that Member Hannes or whoever represents us in the future on that governance board can have the tools that they need when they walk in that room to effectively be making financial decisions that really does impact what's going on here or the bigger part of what they do is be engaged in, in hiring uh, new leadership for that organization. You know, you have to sort of be well in the know to be successful at, at, at doing that. I think one of the things that, um, you know, I, I know I've had conversations with certain uh, members about this in particular is just as we update every other member in the community at our regular board meetings once a month on let's have a conversation on what's going on in policy committee, let's have a conversation on what's going on in legislative. My recommendation as superintendent is to put a SASSET update every month on our board agenda. And then that way, no matter what the governance structure is, you would have the board member and or the superintendent updating what is going on at those particular meetings so the board is in the loop. Now obviously we will continue to forward you the minutes and, and the updates that SASSET provide. But I think having that conversation up here at the dais would, would go a long way into making that a priority for the board and our community so we have a better understanding on a monthly basis of what is occurring at SASSED, what are the big things coming up on the horizon, rather than just uh, getting email notifications uh, from them. One of the things we're going to push for in the strategic planning process is that SASSED you know, does a better job communicating, and again, I don't want to say they're doing an awful job right now, but doing a better job communicating some of those updates to their local members. Um, but, but really, Darren, to answer your question, I would recommend that we put this on the same level in terms of updates that we have our current committees on. Uh, I think that will go a long way. And then, Member Hannes, mm -hmm. uh, is there any sort of additional things that you want sure. to add, yeah, add to this as well? Just to give like a little background on kind of how this discussion came up in SACID. Um, I would say maybe six months ago-ish, um, some of the other uh, member districts brought up this idea to the full board of control at a meeting, you know, just kind of throwing it out there for a discussion topic. What do people think about this? A lot of them, like Kevin had mentioned, had come from previous districts, superintendents in previous districts who had been in other cooperatives that were structured more like this as opposed to the way SASA is structured, structured more where superintendents were, um, you know, the, the representatives on the, the board of control, which will now be, be called the board of directors going forward, and then having, um, still having that governing board with uh, elected board members. And I think their initial thought process was that, you know, um, board members are volunteers and it's an added member an added meeting to their month and all these types of things and they were kind of trying to say you know this is this is our job and this is our responsibility as superintendent to take on this role which i can obviously appreciate and respect that but i spoke up at that meeting and said i certainly don't feel like some sort of undue obligation to be here as a volunteer and i feel don't feel burdened by this role in any way but i agree with their thought process um in having superintendents take on this role because I feel like SASSET is a very complex organization. Um, it's very hard to understand all of the inner workings and the day-to-day -day operations of what SASSED needs and what the students and the families and the member districts needs when you really have very little understanding of the organization itself and how it impacts our district and all the other member districts and the students and the families. Um, and I feel like I have a little bit of a, of a leg up compared to a lot of other potential board members because I have a lot of experience with special ed just for my own kids' needs. And so I didn't come in there completely blind to how SASID works or, or what some of the terminology they use or, or the programs that are offered and things like that. But it's still, I still feel like I still don't completely have a super firm grasp in my own personal opinion on what the exact needs and day-to-day -day operations should look like and how especially how that impacts us at 58 financially um, in terms of getting our students the placements they need all these different types of things there's just it's so complex of an organization that I feel like when I would go when I go to the meetings I often feel like I don't 
like I wish I could contribute more productively because I oftentimes feel like I don't have a lot to contribute or a lot to say that is going to move SASID forward in a good direction because I just don't have the experience. I don't have the knowledge for what's needed for SASID, for the students, for the cooperative, for the member districts. I, I don't have the knowledge because I'm that's not my area of expertise, whereas these superintendents, they live these things day to day. They know exactly what we need as, as a district sending our students to SASID. They know exactly how the financial things implicate the budget concerns, all those things. Um, my personal opinion is that it will be more productive for SASID. It will help SASID to be more successful and make more forward progress, and it will be more beneficial for us as a district and for our students who are utilizing SASID programming, um, having our superintendent be the representative on that board. Um, I just think they can contribute more productively. And, and I've been on the board for two years, and like I said, I came in with, with some understanding, and I still feel like I don't have a for my own like personal capability like I, I wish I could understand it better you know um, and so it, I think what Kevin's talking about where you know if he gave a, a monthly update and if I'm gonna you know continue to be the um, district representative on the governing board certainly obviously if he's providing a monthly update for SASID and I would of course be more than willing and, and able to communicate with Kevin and keep in touch and, and like you're talking about how, how, how does the Board of Governance member then know what's happening with SASA to step in there for our two or three meetings a year that we would attend to make decisions on budget, make decisions on hiring, things like that. Um, obviously that line of communication would have to be open between myself and Kevin to kind of keep abreast with what's going on in SASA. Mm -hmm. um, because I wouldn't be at those monthly meetings anymore, obviously. But I think, and honestly, I think that would be more effective. I think I can get a better understanding from Kevin as to hit, for, for him to speak to me directly to 58's needs and how, how SASID is impacting us directly as opposed to just going to those monthly meetings where oftentimes they're just talking about SASID and I, you know, am trying to learn and I'm trying to gather the information, but it's, it's I think this would be a more effective way to, to handle the situation. And that's just, you know, in my opinion, and that's kind of how it came about and how it went forward. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Questions, comments? I'm glad we're not voting on this tonight um, because I, I honestly don't know how I would vote. Um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna be very careful with what I say, but um, as, as somebody who was on the board uh, two years ago, um, and somebody who is in the community now, and uh, I would say it's, there are opportunities to improve at SASID that I'm being made aware of. Um, just, just some, you know, a couple times in the last year, someone's come up to me and said, "Oh, you're on the 58 board. Let me, I work for SASID. Let me tell you what's going on there." Um, I, I do feel like there are some opportunities to improve, and my experience on the board of control from two years ago, um, my 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 takeaway was um, the superintendents. Who, rep, who, who made up 50% of that board were not willing to have a, a serious conversation when it came down to um, the, the appraisal of, of programming and, 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 and staff. And I will give Kevin all the credit in the world if Kevin is our representative on the board of control he will have that hard conversation, or, or those hard conversations, and I, and I know that. Doug Purcell always used to say, um, you know, we are very lucky to have good leadership in, in, in 58 because he's, he's, when he was on the, he was very involved in this asset board, and he would say, you know, I, I, I can see how strong our leaders are when, when I'm around so many other superintendents. Um, I, I have all the confidence in the world that Kevin would be the right man for the job. I don't, I'm concerned about a, a structure <laughs> whereby a bunch of peers are responsible for evaluating their own peer. And I've seen, I saw it fail. That's, I, I saw that structure fail two years ago. And I don't, I, I don't, I, I, I think the idea is fine. I just, I'm just concerned with the timing of it. Because I just feel like there's a lot to improve first. Um, and it's, it's unfortunate this is coming up now because I, I think it's, it's, it's as, as Kevin explained to me, we had a lot of conversations about, around this um, in the past and today when I, when I wanted to speak about this specific um, amendment to the Articles of Agreement, but I, I think that um, 
there's some things that need to get gotten in order over at SASID first, and I'm, I, I'm not sure that, um, I, I just, I'm concerned that with, when you take away the elected officials off the board, that you're not going to have the oversight that is probably required to get the job done. Because I think, like I said, from my previous experiences, everybody wanted everybody wanted to go easy on their peer when it came down to uh, it came down to evaluating. So, um, again, I know Kevin would would be would be would be firm and and and, and fair, but I, I just I'm concerned about the the other superintendents uh, getting the job done. So. Um, that's my, my, my impression. I don't, I don't think it's, I don't think this is, I don't think it would be, um, I'm not saying it would be better okay. if you had 50-50. I'm just concerned that this is, you know, I, I just hope we can get the job done under this existing structure and Kevin's the man to do it. So um, I agree with uh, the conversation around um, more transparency with this board from, from stuff coming out of SASID so we can, um, better direct how that works. So I, I, I look forward to that going um, into the future. And, uh, and I appreciate um, those comments. And, and I think you're, you're, you're spot on in terms of increasing the transparency in the direction that this board could provide either myself or Emily and either the current structure or let's say this proposed structure goes through. I think in my four years since I've been the superintendent, this is probably the lengthiest conversation that we've had at SASIT. Now, obviously, we had many things, you know, going on before that. But when you look at just how big SASIT impacts, you know, what we do on a day-to-day -day operation from Jessica's position to my position to our students, um, I do think that it, it's time that we elevate the conversation with SAS, and I think that can be one of the positive outcomes to what they're doing with strategic planning right now and even considering changes to their joint articles of agreement. Um, this is a big thing for so many of our families, and it, it's so important, and, and also it's a big financial spend that we do every single year in the school district, and so really making sure that we're having timely conversations uh, regardless of the governance structure, I think is the right thing to do with our Board of Education. You know, the other thing I'll throw out there is Dr. Mardonia just talked about, you know, focusing on areas uh, that we want to really hone in on as a school district. You know, this could either go under instruction or it could go in, into a separate thing on its own in terms of a, a key performance indicator and things like that. But there's some opportunities in the strategic planning process as well that we might want to take a look at this area amongst other things um, to really, um, you know, make sure that our voices are heard on behalf of our, our students. So if there are any other questions or things that you would like us to get answers from, from SASSET or from Mindy McGuffin, the executive director, please reach out to us. We've got plenty of time before the April meeting. We're happy to bring that to you. The other thing that Jessica and I have talked a lot about is bringing the SASSET leadership to our board in a future spotlight so that we could outline for not only the Board of Education but also for our community our role in SASSET, what that looks like, you know, Steve, we were talking about dollars before, you know, what is the spend that we have on SASSET? How many of our kids are there? What are the programs? How many programs do we have in our district? Uh, again, I think that uh, the timing is right for that just general overview so the board can build that background knowledge on how we're using the special education uh, cooperative. Um, I also want to take this time, um, there are always all sorts of rumors out there in the community. I've heard them and I, I know some board members that have even been approached that District 58 is considering leaving Sasset. I want to I stop that right now. I don't know where that rumor is coming from. We've never talked about uh, leaving the cooperative at all. Certainly we've talked about building efficiencies, uh, but that is not a recommendation that I, I'm even considering making to the Board of Education as your superintendent, and so sometimes I like to use the opportunity as a board meeting to say that uh, no one has discussed that at, at our team, nor have we ever made that recommendation to our board. SASIT is really just a very positive uh, extension of the services that District 58 provides to some of its neediest students, so we couldn't do it without their support. Okay. Any other questions or comments from the board tonight? All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right, this is now an opportunity for members of the audience to share public comment with the board, but it is not intended to be a time for members of the public to engage in a dialogue with the board. Issues raised during public comment may be added to future agendas or addressed by administrative staff as appropriate. The board has allocated 30 minutes tonight for public comment. We ask that you keep your comments to three minutes to allow everyone the opportunity to speak. And at this time, do we have any cards over there? We do not have any cards. Um, is there anybody here that's interested in making a public comment? 
All right. All right. The first up is we have an approval of minutes. Are there any suggested revisions to the minutes presented in the packet of materials? All right, if not, is there a motion to approve the minutes from the February 13th, 2023 regular meeting as presented? So moved. Second. All right, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion carried to approve the minutes of the February 13th, 2023 regular meeting as presented. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of the February 27th, 2023 special meeting and curriculum workshop as presented? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, the motion carried to approve the minutes of the February 27th, 2023 special meeting and curriculum workshop as presented. All right, we have a consent agenda tonight. Are there any items a board member would like to have considered separately? All right, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda consisting of the personnel report and the financial statements consisting of the list of bills and summary? So moved. Second. All right, Melissa, please call roll. Member Weiner. Aye. <coughs> Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. And Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried. The consent agenda has been approved as presented in the packet of materials. Some recommendations for action tonight. First up is the strategic planning consultant. Is there a motion to approve RJM Consulting, Dr. Robert Madonia, and the proposed process at a cost of $15,000 to facilitate the district's strategic plan uh, for school year 23-24 to school year 28 through 29. So moved. Second. All right, any discussion? Melissa, please call roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye, the motion carried to approve RJM Consulting. Dr. Robert Madonia and the proposed process at a cost of $15,000 to facilitate the district's strategic plan for school year 23 to 24 through uh, school year 28 to 29. All right, next up is the first student contract renewal. Is there a motion to approve the one year contract extension of 6.5% with first student for a student transportation for the 2023 through 2024 uh, as shown in the attached proposed rates? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Melissa, please go roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve a one year contract extension of 6.5% with first student for student transportation for the 2023 through 2024 school year as shown in the attached proposed rates. Next up is the Sunrise Transportation Contract Renewal. Is there a motion to approve the contract extension for the 2023 through 2024 school year with Sunrise Transportation for a Special Education Transportation Services? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All right, Melissa, please go roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the contract extension for the 2023 through 2024 school year for the Sunrise Transportation for Special Education Transportation Services. Last up is a bid for landscape maintenance. Is there a motion to award the landscape maintenance bid to Langton Group of Woodstock, Illinois at a total cost of $91,253? So moved. Second. All right. Any discussion? All right. Well, let's please go roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to award the landscape maintenance bid to Langton Group of Woodstock, Illinois at a total cost of $91,253. We have a con uh, construction consent agenda tonight. Are there any items a board member would like to have considered separately? All right. Is there a motion to approve the construction consent agenda consisting of, a, of bids as presented in the packet of materials? So moved. Second. All right, Melissa, please call roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried. The consent agenda, the construction consent agenda has been approved as presented in the packet of materials. All right. A couple of announcements, or actually just one announcement. The next meeting will be on Monday, April 10th at 7 p.m. It'll be right back here at Village Hall. All right. The board will now meet in closed session. The board will now meet in closed session. Is there a motion to move to closed session to discuss the appointment, employment, compensation, discipline, performance, or dismissal of specific employees of the district? That's 5 ILCS 122C1. 
the consideration of student disciplinary matters it's 5 ILCS 122 C 9 litigation when the public body finds that an action is probable or imminent in which case the basis of the finding shall be recorded and entered into the minutes of the closed meeting 5 ILCS 122 C 11 and discussion of uh, minutes of meetings lawfully closed under the Open Meetings Act, whether for the purposes of approval of the body of minutes or the semi-annual review of the minutes is mandated by section 2.06, that's 5 ILCS 122C21. So moved. Second. All right, any discussion on that? All right, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carried. The board will now move into closed session. After a short recess, uh, let's meet at 10.05.